And that's from my girlfriend. And she got that to me like week three of dating her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are live now. So, oh, uh, so hello, hello to the people out there. <laughs> uh, welcome to Tone Talk with Mark mm -hmm. Yuzansky and Dave Friedman. And today's guest is Henning Pauly of Tone Talk. No, I'm sorry. Of GitCon. <laughs> of GitCon. How was GitCon? <laughs> <laughs> Wow, Mark. <laughs> I, had, I, had, I had to do it. I just had to do it. I, sorry. Sorry. What can I tell you? Um, you're, uh, you're not doing, doing it with enough force. No? I know. You uh, do it with much more force. You actually, uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I might break something. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah I usually break things. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you, buddy? Thanks for joining. I, 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 uh, for, uh, thanks for having me on for reasons that are still unfathomable to me. Why? We've had lots of people. We've had lots yeah, of people on. Like, and a, you had really good guitar players on, which not here. B, people that make good things, which again, not here. And people that know stuff. Well, not quite right. I don't, still, I don't know why I'm here. It's Tone Talk. What do I know about Tone? Look at all those amps behind you. Well, did, anyone can buy amps. That's not a, that, that's very easy. <laughs> Knowing well, what you, they do and how to use them, that's a whole different issue. Well, well let's get into that. So uh, do you know what you're doing? Mm -mm. <laughs> no, you don't know what you're doing. Up until, well, up until probably now about almost 10 years ago, uh, I used pods. Pod 2 and Pod HD or whatever. That's I used bad <laughs> model. I think we all did that. When I first started, that's what was like the first thing that I got. Like, so that goes back to what we were talking about before we went live, right? I mean, when I, when I first started out, that was, I bought a Squire Red Strat. That was my first guitar and a pod, a little, uh, Dean pod. What, yeah, what, I had that what year did you start playing guitar? Uh, when, whenever, I guess that was around the time that that came out. It was probably around, uh, I don't know, 16, 17 years ago. So I haven't been playing guitar that long. I've been playing drums much longer. Oh, I see. I see. You're so you're a baby guitar player still. Yeah, pretty, uh, under 20 years. They, yeah. they didn't have they didn't have such things when I was a kid. Well, well they I, actually they might have had a Squire Strat, but uh, no, maybe not. Oh, yeah, no, they did the good ones, though, the Japanese ones. Oh, well, yeah, that's completely different. I, I lived in an apartment in, in Boston when I went to Berkeley and I had a Digitech GSP 2101, which was not even a model, it was just horrible drive sounds. But I mean, that's what I used to record in the apartment. Back in Germany, where, before I left, I had a uh, an Engel Savage 120 because that just came out and that was big and I had money to buy. Mm. So I didn't know why I bought that, but that was my first, you know, 120 watt tube head. But then I moved to Boston and I needed something you know, to go DI. And then the part came out, that bean thing, and that was much better than the Digitech, so I bought that. And again, then again, apartment in LA. So it, it just stayed with that technology. And sadly, it stayed with that technology throughout making a whole bunch of albums that should have been recorded with actual amps. Oh, wow. So you actually recorded albums with the pod? I'd like to oh, go I back and... an album with James Labrie with it, Sebastian Bach. I'm, I did big time, like, prog metal albums with early early modelers which uh i was never happy with the the sounds uh i was happy with the music and everyone loved the music but i know the production could have been better hmm. which now i i got the dvds of those sessions out and yeah music's dead so you can't make any money with it but i can use that music now for my videos <laughs> um so i'm actually re-recording these songs with james Labrie and sebastian bach uh with good amps now oh, really? and uh, I just did uh, two for the Ampete amps, and I'm going to do uh, uh, one for, for the Morgan, and I might use a Friedman. Yeah, why not? They're, they're decent. <laughs> and they're, they're decent right now. Um, uh, so, uh, and I, I got uh, on loan the new Petrucci seven-string ugly ass. <laughs> you know, but the, the thing is, is... Is it the Monarch or something? What is it called? It's the Monarchy Majesty. It's just... But I don't like the look. I never liked the Petrucci guitars. That thing arrived, and from the first second, you were like, what's going on here? It just plays 
it, I feel like I can actually play like Petrucci on that thing. <laughs> it is, it is a phenomenally good guitar. Just don't look at it. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I recorded yeah. a track from that from the James Labrie album. So I mean, you know, who has the luxury of doing a demo for that guitar on YouTube, but actually have a track with James Labrie singing? So that was that's really cool. So I, I re-recorded um, that, and after. 14 years, I know, 13 years, that track finally sounded like I wanted it to sound on the original album. I redid the drums, had, you know, fatter drum sounds, but definitely had the the guitar sounds that I always wanted. Yeah, this, I mean, there is a big difference, obviously, in real guitar tar and real amps compared to obviously using a pod, but um, I, I, even still with modelers, I, I think. But you know, getting back to from begin, you know, with beginners, uh, do you think your videos are over beginners' heads, Henning? I hope not. Um, I have some fans uh, commenting always, like, "Ah, oh, why do you always explain what a compressor does in every compressor video?" We get it. Y yeah, you get it. But if someone watches that video for the first time and is interested in that compressor and hasn't seen more of my videos, then he might still need that information. And there's always at the beginning of the video saying, explanation what a compressor does, and you can skip that at any point in time. I don't understand people who bitch about videos being long. It, yeah. It's not linear, it's YouTube. Just skip it, it's very simple. Why take the time bitching about it if you could just move that slider? Yeah, move the slider a little bit and you get, get right past whatever you're saying. <laughs> maybe maybe this, is, maybe this is what we need to tell those people. People you're watching, imagine you're on the other you, not the YouTube, the other you, you know? And there's always this beginning portion of the video where the pizza man comes. You skip over that till it actually starts, if you know what I mean, right? Uh -huh. You guys know what I mean, right? Yeah, of course. But everyone knows how to use that slider on the other you platform. So just use it on YouTube as well. It's very simple. I agree. I agree. I mean, look, I, your videos aren't even half as long as ours. Ours are like five hours long. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we had a marathon video in the last video. At, yeah. Uh, yeah clocking, I, I heard clocking in at you, four hours and 40, yeah, four minutes. Four minutes. <laughs> that sounds like when Phil McKnight and I Skype. I had this night with Phil. Oh, that sounds awesome. Um, <laughs> I, 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 you, you want to re, 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 just. Say that again, a different way. I had an amazing night with Phil McKnight once. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> um, the first time we ever skyped, and we just it, time passed, and we didn't even notice. It was four in the morning for me, and it was a five and a half hour conversation. We could have just kept going, and this happens every time we talk because he's just the nicest freaking guy and maybe it's the bald heads or whatever something <laughs> you guys get mesmerized with mesmerized. each other I, i've learned so much uh, uh wait hi caroline i just just need to say hi to you oh you're watching the chat yeah yeah and there's uh there's some of my fans here which is nice you guys found me <laughs> anyway <laughs> um, um um with Phil, I learned so much from him about YouTube stats and uh, analytics and, and watch num what numbers are good and, and what to look for. Hmm. And then we talked about, we, we bitch about companies a lot. You know, companies that don't get YouTube and that don't want to support what we do. And, uh, uh, and there are quite a few. And so we, we share a lot of behind the scenes stuff that can help the other. And uh, he's just such a great guy. He is. You know, uh, something you just said is I don't I don't really understand these companies that don't understand what's going on with so you know your social media, your YouTube, your uh, that is your advertising now. That I mean that is yeah. everything. There there is no print. There's no there's you know we occasionally once in a great while do a print ad just because we should just touch on it maybe once a year or something right. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it needs to be all digital. You know, di digital. Yeah, all your social media, your 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 Twitter, your Instagram, your um, Facebook, um, and various other, and of course YouTube and all the videos. Well, I mean, so. I, I think print is still 
it's nice to have a magazine in your hand and it's nice to have a shiny ad for the new Friedman amp, for example. Yeah. But you can't only have that because the next step, this thing is, the, the ad is dead. It doesn't make a sound. It doesn't give you anything other than the information that the product is there. And I think that information should be given also in print. But the next step will be YouTube. So if you don't cover that, then you have nowadays only have done step number one. Right. And the sad thing still is, well, let, let's go, th go through some numbers. That print ad needs to be designed. You have to pay a designer to do it. And uh, usually it's not your buddy, your neighbor. It's someone that actually takes money. And they take a couple of hundred bucks to design the ad. So you've already dropped a couple of hundred bucks before you've paid the actual fee in the magazine. And let's not kid ourselves. If you want reviews in magazines, you're buying them by placing ads. If you don't advertise, they claim, oh, we don't have time for a review. They'll give you some bullshit, but in the end, the advertising is how you get into the magazines, how you get featured. Uh -huh. um, and that's always been the case. So that's okay. That's how you're buying yourself in. But here in Germany, a print ad will run you in a, in a magazine that can reach about 6,000 people. Um, it'll run you about 3K. 6,000 so, people? 6,000 people, which is... Nothing. It's, it's nowadays that's nothing. That's nothing. Uh, so that'll run you 3K. There's no YouTuber, none that I know that, that can take those prices. The highest price that I've heard of someone doing a four or five minute demo was 1500 euro. And that's quite, that's quite a bit. Oh. And, uh, and I'm at about a 10th of that print ad for a video that uses seven 4K cameras where I'll spend a good 20 to 30 minutes or sometimes more running pedal through a wall of amps. And I mean, the production, the price of the production alone, if you went to a company and said, I want a video in the video and audio quality of what Henning does, I don't think you could afford that. A video company would simply just probably say, okay, we're going to start at 5K. Yeah, it's expensive. I talked to a guy, uh, we, we rented a, a cabin a couple of weeks ago on a donkey farm. I know it sounds funny, but the guy... <laughs> was that, was that, with Phil <laughs> that wasn't with Phil McKnight, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't uh, on the donkey farm. <laughs> so the, the guy okay. renting out the cabin on the donkey farm runs an ad agency that does video stuff. And I asked him, we, we, we talked, and I told him the, the setup I have. And I said, what would you charge? He says, the video company that he works with, they will charge 450 euro a second now nah. a second of produced finished video mm. so if you have a 30 second spot you know what you pay so obviously what i'm doing is different but those are the prices that you would charge if you're a video production company now that video production company doesn't have a guitar player doesn't have a recording studio so they still have to hire the player that knows what he's doing with the pedals and the amps they'll have to hire a recording engineer what we YouTubers do has a real value, independent of the fact that we actually have an audience that we build, right? which we bring to the table as well. I mean, your channel has a significant amount of people, I would imagine. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping tonight I crack 58,000. I need another 25 people or something, or 30 people. All right, so well, everybody, everybody follow Henning's channel. Follow Henning, people. Yes. Well, yeah, but I mean, it, yeah, and, and that as a company that is paying someone to do a video, let's say a YouTuber, some, some mm -hmm. of these videos they, they want to do for their own channels, and you, there's, there's a whole bunch of different uh, ways to do this, but if you're, you're paying uh, someone like Pete Thorne or, or Henning or to do, a, you know, a nice in-depth video, part of what you're paying for is their, their audience also, because it's not... Generally speaking, it depends. It depends on how we do it, but a lot of times it's going on their channel alone. It's not then being also put on our own YouTube channel, mm -hmm. exactly. Because um, it's true. that's not really good to do both. Um, right. you so could do so, a, you could so do an like, excerpt. You could do like a like a scene from their video to promote it. Yeah, well, you can promote the video, but I'm just yeah. saying putting it on. You don't want to put it uh, have it on their YouTube and also on your own. No. Uh, you want to drive everything one direction or the other. Um, 
but you know, with uh, Pete Thorne, I think Pete's like over a hundred thousand mm -hmm. subscribers now, and and you know, it it makes there's it's a lot of impact. It gets a lot of impact. You can't get to a hundred thousand people with any other form of advertising in our business. Mm -hmm. You, you, you right. can't you can't buy TV ads. Um, you might be able to get to that many people if you buy like a banner ad on Ultimate Guitar or something, which I don't, that'll run you probably more than Pete's video. And it still doesn't make a sound. It's just a little banner. Mm -hmm. And also, and also with the print ads, okay, and 3000 is cheap um, for that print ad that you were talking about. Mm -hmm realistically, I mean, for like full page ads or something like that, I mean, you're looking in the U S here at a major guitar magazine, you're looking at, you know, six to $8,000. And this is, <laughs> this is for one issue monthly. Yeah. And one it, issue. It, one time. It, oh. It's on the bathroom floor. And then, then it's gone. It's gone. It's thrown away. It's done. That's you know? amazing. So, what about those? What about those ads in the back? What do those typically run? Well, I mean, they, it all scales down depending on the size of your ad, you know. But, yeah. but I mean, it's by f no means cheap. Yeah. It's somewhere between everything, somewhere between three to six thousand dollars. So. And and for that, wow. you could buy videos on. We're gonna say five to six YouTube channels, depending on who you're talking to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Five to six YouTube yeah. channels and get way more spread on on, the, on your dollar. Um. I actually heard, and, and that pissed me off to no end, because um, let's go into what we do at NAM for a second. We fly to NAM. It costs us money. I'm lucky enough that the company takes me. But most of the YouTubers fly to NAM on their own dime. Hotels are ridiculously expensive. So the week of NAM will cost the YouTuber two and a half, three thousand euro. And Dave, thank you so much for helping Kiana out. That was amazing. Oh, yeah, um, no problem. And uh, so for someone like Kiana to go to NAM, she's a student, it's just it cost prohibitive. It doesn't work. So we go to NAM and we make videos there. So we run around with expensive video gear on our own dime and we advertise for NAM. We advertise for the manufacturers. NAM, I can't even reach the PR lady. Um, they don't support us in any way. We don't get any internet connection to upload our videos. It would be nice for us to have a you know, joint room where we can charge our batteries, put our bags down, just That's help ridiculous. us out a, a little bit. No, we all go for our own money and, and, and all this stuff. And so that's one thing where Gitcon comes in. I want us to unite and say no more. Help mm -hmm. Nam help us out because your freaking word, Nam, is in every single one of our videos. We are advertising for... And we're paying for it. We're, we're going there. And also for the manufacturers, and sorry about that, Dave, but I want us to somehow get the tiniest bit of payment for what we do. If every manufacturer that we go to spends 50 bucks on a video, 50 bucks for me, 50 bucks for Phil McKnight, 50 bucks for the Tone King, and we make 40 videos at NAMM, so we work our asses off, mm -hmm. we've at least broken even. We don't go home with money in our bags, but we've broken even. And I don't think it's too much to ask from PRS or Boutique Amp or Vox or Boss or whoever to pay us 50, maybe 100 bucks to cover what they have at the booth. I don't think that's too much to ask. That was my idea. Now, here's what I heard. There's a magazine, we're not gonna say which one, there's a few, Mm -hmm. that also does YouTube videos, NAM coverage. Mm -hmm. They will charge you three grand to do the NAM video. And they're getting it from a lot of the manufacturers. They'll come to your booth and they do nothing more than what I do with no better equipment than what I do. Less right. funny than what I do. Um, <laughs> okay? they'll, just do they'll just do informative videos. Right. Who needs that? And they'll probably get less clicks than what we get on our channels. Yet the manufacturers fork over 3,000 bucks to have a video made by them. Because they think they have a legitimate following or, or something, right? I mean, the, wow. Um, but the numbers are there. Look at their clicks. Look at our clicks. Right. 
buy me an ice cream, you get a video, pay them 3000 Clicks are the same. Uh, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, did you that approach did you approach manufacturers and ask them, Henning, about the idea about mm -hmm. NAM to see what they thought? Not yet. I need to make sure that I get my ducks in a row, as one says. I need. I, I want to. I know in America that's an evil word. Unionize some of the YouTubers, so that when I go and say, "Hey, Dave." Give me a hundred bucks. I make a video of your of your booth. I want to make a video anyway, but somehow I need to pay for this. But then, ten other YouTubers just show up <laughs> and make it. Then it's gonna go like, well, yeah, I did right, it for right. them. What, what? We all need to be on the same page. We all need to just say, yeah, we don't want to get rich, but it would be nice to not have to pay to go there, and also have Nam support us. So, at GitCon, it would be would have been nice if we actually had meetings in a closed room, just the YouTubers to discuss some of those things all in one room. Right. I had no time to do any of this. So now I'm having Skype sessions with Gear Man Dude and with Tyler Larson, with Phil McKnight, but it's all just a one-on-one. -on -one. I need to get us all together again to find out what can we do so that what we do gets legitimized and that we get stronger. It's, hard though. Have... it's yeah. hard though because you're always going to have new people coming up who are going to be doing the same thing that you're doing, and yeah, do. but it, but but here, but here's the thing: as a manufacturer, you you want to see uh, a, a, an established guy. Mm -hmm. You want to see them with lots of subscribers, um, and that is what you want. Uh, a, a new guy, it's nice, a new guy, and he can do the free video or whatever, but. You're not going to get much out of it. You, you want the Phil it. McKnight, you want the Henning, you want the Pete but Thorne, you want you want uh, Sean Tubbs, you want you want all these guys. So you would pay, you would pay the hundred dollars here, hundred dollars there, hundred. You know what? It's just like fifty, hundred dollars doesn't sound. Uh, that's fine. That's fine with me. I, it doesn't I don't, sound unfair. Yeah. I don't think that sounds unfair because how many are you really going to do? Okay, so so let's look at this. Maybe uh, let's say you do six, six people, right. six YouTube major YouTubers. And yeah. and honestly, honestly, uh, six is plenty. You know, I, I think four is fine too. Uh, you know, you're only talking six hundred dollars at max mm -hmm. for 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 six videos on the products. I, I don't think that's you know even even for a brand. Let's take PIs for example. They have a huge booth. I mean, they're dropping a minimum. I don't know, a minimum of thirty, forty thousand bucks on them, with oh, everything. More. Uh, it, oh, with more. the booth and everything, it's got to be more. more. Yeah. yeah. And all, all the staff and the hotels and the food, it costs real money. More. So for them to budget in, let's say, let's let's go nuts, twenty YouTube channels, twenty, which yeah. will get them guaranteed coverage of twenty guys, and for them to budget in another two grand, it's that's nothing. Chump, nothing. Chump nothing. change. Yeah. It, and so. I want all of us to just pull on the same string and say, okay, you know what? We, we don't want to get rich off this, but going there for free just doesn't make an awful lot of sense. Now, that said, the post GitCon discussion and Phil McKnight asked all his fans about, you know, Nam, what do you think? Uh, they told him, don't even do it. We don't care. GitCon was awesome. That's the kind of stuff we want. Nam is pointless. So we are already discussing this uh, uh, in, in little groups of have totally changing our approach to NAM because this, I go to the booth and I put my camera at some piece of gear and I, if at all, badly record it, you know, yeah. it cannot really make a demo at the Friedman booth. Well, at no, the Friedman booth, that's too loud. Just, well, yeah, so I, I could. That's true. But, in most places, there really isn't time or the surrounding or, or the situation to do it. So I'm yelling into mics over the NAM noise, mm -hmm. pointing at the rep from the company. They're not great videos. Now, the socializing aspect of GitCon is, I think, something that could be really cool. And what we want to do is um, we want to run around in groups. So it's Phil McKnight. Now we run around and do a couple of companies and then we'll trade places and I get Glenn Fricker and uh, Phil gets the Tone King 
-hmm. And then there's a couple of videos with, you know, just different groups. So it, it wouldn't be, hey, Dave, show us the new amp. It'll be Phil and I walking in there just discussing generally what we think of Friedman. And if Dave pokes his head in, that's cool. And it's, it's going to be like us sharing our thoughts and experiences about this particular product. But it's a little bit more about the two of us socializing and shooting the shit versus let me show you this brand new Friedman amp. <laughs> it's what, right. You know, I think that social aspect and just goofing off will be more interesting to the viewers. And the product, it, it'll be more product placement than a flat out we're here at the Friedman booth and this amp has 74 dB more. Oh, do I know? Stats. No one right. cares about it. <laughs> I don't know what amps. Well, I think I, I actually think the idea of combining the YouTubers is great. Um, because I thought it, that was a great element of the GitCon that at least that I from my viewing that I really enjoyed, which was seeing guys like Pete Thorne and and you you and uh, you know Phil X and and Phil McKnight and the Tone King everybody just kind of interacting with it with everybody and and having fun but still talking about gear still talking about the things that we love to talk about but it was you know I think there's an element of that interaction that people love and the, and people have gotten also to know people through these videos so they feel like oh that's so cool that Henning's talking to Phil and you know at least that's what kind I thought of I thought the coolest thing was that people got to know Phil X because I thought, well, duh, it's Phil X. Everyone knows. Oh, no. If you look at the comments at the live streams from, from the stage, a lot of people were, who is that guy? And oh, my God, he's amazing. And oh, my God, his tone, blah, 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 blah. But there was a lot of we didn't know who he was. So funny enough. GitCon gave Phil a couple more fans, which I would have, who would have thought yeah, that that's yeah, even yeah. possible? Yeah. But, but that showed you with the spread of all these viewers from all around the globe that some of them like these channels, some of them like those channels, there was something new to discover for everyone. And it was, I wasn't really as involved in videos. I didn't really make any videos in any of the rooms, which really bumped me out. But I mean, I had to make it work. Now, I think GitCon is also going to change because what you saw was all these channels meeting and being able to make real videos for the first time. Not a meet and greet at NAMM, but an actual let's sit down and shoot the shit. Mm. So a lot of the coverage and a lot of the content was them feeling each other out, them interviewing each other. Next year, well, those videos have been done. Mm -hmm. So I think next year will be much more heavy on gear and more actual content about let's do something together about, you know, scales, let's teach something, let's show gear. Now it was more, we all meet and we'll do what we do. You know, here's Glenn, here's Colin, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's going to, it's going to, you know, change over time. And it was the first one. So you would expect yeah. that there's going to be tweaks and those types of things. But uh, can you take us back and tell us how did GitCon even get started? Like, because I mean, I remember when you were announcing it and and everything, and I was like, oh, this is really interesting. I have no expectation of what it's about. I, I you know, in my mind, I was like, is it NAM? Is it what is it? <laughs> um, you know, but but how how did you how did you start it? What what was what was the uh, the you know the impetus? Uh. You know, I feel, I'm going to be straight in your face, honest with you, Mark. Right, this right here. Yeah. That's why I don't make albums anymore. <laughs> and I know this, you have no idea what in the world I'm talking about. You make an album and right after it comes out, you get questions and you're like, oh, this is cool. They're interested in, they like the music. And then you answer those questions. And the second interview, you do that and it's cool. And then it gets very stale. And then you tell the same story 20 times and you're like, I wish I hadn't made that album. Let me just go back in the studio and make music. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so you're so, saying that you've, you've been asked this question too many times. Is that what you're saying? Quite, quite a few times. All right. So, so then, then let's, let's not even address it then. Have you addressed this question um, on video that you can address you can send me to it so I can, I can watch no, 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 it. I'll, I'll, I, I shall enlighten you. Okay. <laughs> but, um, I was at the first Warwick base camp that I went to, which was uh, three years ago. 
And I had no expectations. I had 12,000 subscribers. Heinz-Peter Wilfer invited me for reasons unknown to me. Um, and it was amazing. And I, I wanted to do some interviews. I interviewed uh, Phil X and Devin Townsend and bass players. But who cares? Um, you know, like <laughs> I, I talked to um, uh, uh, Billy Shee and a whole bunch of guys. It was an amazing week. And I had no expectations other than who spends 1200 bucks to get bass lessons for a week? Are those people nuts? And on the first night, it was very clear that they go there because it's a family. You're standing next to Lee Skla and everyone's just hanging out. And this is an amazing atmosphere. And it got better and better and better throughout the week. The food was insane. The facility was ridiculous. And more and more people kept pouring in. And at the, when, at the end of base camp, Phil X hugs you continuously keeps hugging you every time he sees you and says, dude, dude, whatever you need, I'm your friend. Let me know what you need. I'm there. Um, you go home, you're like, what just happened? <laughs> what, 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 what in the world? How did I, what? And so, but Basecamp is an kind of industry insider thing. There are, there's some press and there's interviews being done, but it's really known to the people that are there. So all these artists that get invited, they know about it. And it's a merging of the base world. Mm. And it's amazing for that. And it's great for Warwick and Framers for the networking inside the industry. But to the outside world, most people don't know what's going on there. So I said to Hans Peter, who wants to make Framers, you know, a big brand, which it should be because I great guitars. So I said, I thought about what can we do that gets frames out there? And I've told him, YouTube, 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 YouTube. Well, it's one of those old school guys that rather piece print ads. Mm. So um, he understands YouTube too, but then of course you need to know the people and how it, how it works and all this. So I said, let's do an event exactly like it for a fraction of the cost because you're not inviting two, 300 people. You just have 20, <coughs> okay? You have 20 guys. And we'll do videos together and it's all going to be about gear. So instead of being a networking insider thing, it's all about outside, outside, outside. Mm -hmm. And um, I think he liked the enthusiasm and then took me to Nam, where I could start networking with the YouTubers, then another base camp and a lot of me saying, let's do this. And it kind of went from there. But that atmosphere, I wanted that for us and the food, the buffet is insane. Um, and just everything, and, 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 and Phil standing on stage jamming with all these guys. I wanted exactly that, but I wanted more people to know about it. And I wanted more people to know about the Framus guitars. Mm -hmm. And then um, we had my, my purple guitar built, uh, Merple, and we did that. And people, you know, I, I ended up to be one of the first channels that actually regularly had a Framus. Um, and at some point he said, okay, let's do it. And it was actually rather close, like probably half a year before GitCon. So not a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge was, I knew exactly what I wanted. I wanted base camp, but with rooms where we can make videos and other rooms stacked full of gear. In my head, it was, who wouldn't want to send gear there? I mean, it's all these channels making videos. In my head, it was like, you call up companies, they're like, hey, what do you need? Sure, we're going to send it. Yeah, I was naive. Um, no one got what I had envisioned. Most of the YouTubers had no idea. Mm. Pete Thorne didn't have an idea until a week before it. <laughs> um, when, when I explained it to him, he didn't have any idea that we would be doing the live switching and that really doing the videos for him, uh, cause he doesn't like editing. So for him, that was a dream come true, but he had no <laughs> idea. He didn't know what he should bring into the video gear. And most, most of the YouTubers had no concept of how it would go down. Mm -hmm. Many were, were afraid that it would be like a very commercial thing where they have to cover certain gear. And um, Phil McKnight even, even said, no, Henny, we can tell the companies, we give them a guarantee. I'm like, no, 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 we're not giving anyone a guarantee. My idea was, if I was invited to this event, how would I want it to go down? I don't want to be told by anyone that I have to play something that I'm not comfortable with. I don't want to say this is good if I don't believe it's good. I want my integrity in my channel to remain exactly the way it is. And for that, it simply means no rules. YouTubers come and if, if someone decides that they don't want, want to make videos because it's not their thing, well, then they're not coming next year, but 
but I'm not forcing anyone to pick up any guitar or do anything that they don't want to do, okay? Um, every channel's format was, was, was sacred in a way. And that was the idea. And some YouTubers got it, some didn't. Some YouTubers that weren't there were cautious. They gave me reasons why they couldn't make it, which were bullshit reasons. They just didn't quite know what to expect. They're regretting it now, but can I, I explained it. I had one, two hour Skype sessions with a lot of YouTubers trying to explain this. And then came the companies. Boy, explaining this to companies, any company that knew the list of YouTubers, they were like, whoa. And then there's some companies that don't watch YouTube videos. And they're like, what, we're supposed to spend 2,000 bucks to go to, to this event? We just covered how much one print ad is, okay? So the cheapest that a company could have come to GitCon was about 2,000 bucks. Yeah, I mean... And that's This is nothing. That's a, a ridiculous joke. There were over 300 videos made, and every single video had every company's logo at the end, whether they were in the video or not. And I had to listen to companies telling me, oh, we... It's we don't want to come. We don't. We don't have the budget. It's the first time, you know. People, I don't think knew what to expect, uh, what was going to come out of it, why you guys were getting together. You know, no matter how how many times you probably explained it, it's hard for people to get that vision, right? Yeah, you yeah. know, it's it's hard for people to get the vision. But now I think people have the vision. I don't know, Dave. You didn't have any amps there, right? No, no, I didn't. Uh, but I originally, originally, uh, I would have come to that. Originally, um, oh, you had another. Trip. I was supposed to go. Originally, I was supposed to go to the music productive show, but uh, that wound up not happening in the end because of we were changing sales guys and and sort of the whole trip fell through um, at the last minute. Uh, next year, I'm going. We'll see about that. No, I'm going. <laughs> Well, he, he is, he is one of the problems with, with GitCon. There is a limit in that facility with Warwick of how big it can grow. Mm -hmm. um, because we had 16 brands now. Right. In that room, we have about space for 25. Okay. And it's not just the space in the room. We could find space for amps and guitars somewhere, just shove them in the corner. It, this whole, it looked like a little trade show. I didn't want that at all. Just push the gear in the corner socialize with us, hang out, have coffee. We know you're Dave Friedman. Of course, we're going to grab one of your amps. They don't have to be displayed like at a trade show. It's supposed to be the anti-trade show. That was the whole idea. Let's hang out and become friends. And the gear's there. So right. space isn't the issue. But imagine we had 100 brands there. Mm -hmm. There's only a fixed amount of videos that can be made in a week with a fixed amount of YouTubers in a mm -hmm. fixed amount of rooms. Yeah. If we have 100 brands there, they're not going to get used satisfactory to them. Right. There has to be use a can, Use can mean many things. It can mean uh, 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 Pete Thorne and I, we talk about overdrive pedals, and there's just a Friedman app in the back. Or it can mean Tom Quayle is jamming with someone, and he's jamming with the Houston Kettner, okay? Uh, it's not about the gear, but the gear is there. So it can mean many different things. But if you have too many brands, the, the amount of videos that can be made is directly proportional to the amount of YouTubers that are there and the amount of rooms. Right. So basically, Dave, you can't go. Well, no, no, no. That's not what <laughs> <laughs> Fine, then. But I'm in a, but I'm in, the, in, in a position uh -huh. now, or, or we are in a position now, where I know that we're going to have way more than 25 companies that will want to be there. Now... That means we can pick and choose who we want to be there. Yeah. Wink, wink, be nice to me. Um, and, and the other thing is... We're always nice to you. I know. The other thing is... <laughs> it has to, He's talking to other people. Yeah. <laughs> it, it has to match the group of YouTubers. Yeah. So if we have... If I had a company that made... You mean like Line 6? seven and eight string guitars for modern gent metal. And I have one YouTuber there that does that, that covers, you know, modern does, stuff. Doesn't make it's, sense. 
it, it does it doesn't make sense. If I had yeah. Keith Merrill there, for example, he does that modern kind of stuff. Well, or Ola England was, or something. And he was the only. Let's say he was the only one. Well, Keith Merrow is going to play his Schecter guitar and nothing else. So the, I would know that this company isn't going to get their money's worth. So yeah. they make good stuff, but I don't have the right group of YouTubers. So I also don't just pick the YouTubers with the biggest numbers. It needs to be a nice balance. Um, Dan and Mick from that pedal show said, well, is this only going to be metal guys? Because we don't, we don't do that, you know, and then it doesn't make sense for us. I'm like, no, no, no. I want a beautiful balance of your Phil McKnight and Pixie Licks that like their Ibanez 80s Van halen thing, you know? Mm-hmm. I know Van Halen didn't play in Ibanez, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I know that much, okay? Um, and I want the guys like Dan and Mick who do the overdrive bluesy stuff and the metal guys. It needs to be all these people coming together. So based on the YouTubers that we're going to have, and I'm hoping that I have most of the people back that were already there, plus a few other ones, um, we can pick from the companies that want to come those that make a good, that, that, that gel well together. I probably can't pick 10 amp companies, but does it make sense to have 10 amp companies there? Probably not. You, have have, too you, know, you want to have a good mixture of different gear, I would imagine, right? So pedal companies, certain number of amp companies, certain number of guitar companies, and bass, you know, that, it's going to well, get well, limited. Well, well, I didn't include any bass channels because, again, that would water it down a little bit. To include bass channels and also bass gear, the event would have to grow to the point where I can bring in bass channels as well, which means it would have to grow. Um, and that's facility-wise is going to be an issue, which we're, we'll talk down the line. Maybe at some point we just need a different facility in 10 years. Mm-hmm. I don't know, five years. And we'll actually have acoustic channels, bass channels, uh, drum channels and, yeah. and DJ oh, channels. Drums. All of a sudden, there's, there's like you know, seventy. <laughs> They're in another facility. The drum yeah. channels are all drum, drums <laughs> have to be in another building. Yeah, but, exactly. but here's what here's what's awesome. Should that spiral into this years from now, then you have someone like Tom Quayle, and you have uh the uh what's it, uh, Davey the the bass guy Davey four or five. And then you have someone who does drums and will actually have two or three rooms set up like a practice room and everything is set up, drums, yeah. mic'd and everything. And they'll go in there and they'll That's just right. do videos as a band. Right. And yeah, all of a sudden cool. you're in an actual like band situation. Uh, the potential is amazing, but the facility that we have here is, is limited. But that's um, fixable. That's an easy thing, you know. Unless, That's unless a, it's unless it's limited because of the area that you're at, because I heard it's kind of in the boonies. You know what? The thing is, the Warwick facility is beautiful. It's an absolutely amazing facility. They know how to do these events. They have the music hall. They have this amazing live uh, venue with live streaming capability. If you took it away from there, mm. um, where do you have a club set up with live streaming? Where in 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 the right right in the vicinity you have the capability of having a place to host this with internet, with, you know, everything that we had there. It's difficult. The only way would be to open up more of their facility. In the music hall, there's two beautiful uh, conference rooms. They would be amazing for video. Mm -hmm. But that means you have to go down the road, the 200 meters, which is what, 600 feet, whatever, between where the gear is and where those rooms are. How does that work? You'll pick up the amp and then drive it down there, but then it also means whoever, whoever, whatever YouTuber is making videos over here is kind of not hanging out with the rest because they are in a different, you know, that whole socializing, if it's in two different locations, even if it's on the same road, it's, yeah. it's already being talked about. The facility is, is a big, Big issue. That's and of course, the guitar factory is amazing. If you take it away from there. Well, you know, then, then the, the, like you said, then you just have to keep it limited to a small number of people, small number of manufacturers, YouTubers, keep yeah. it special. And, um, 
And then maybe the following will grow and you don't necessarily have to have so many people there, but maybe you just have a great following on all the work that comes out of it. I think adding a few more YouTubers, even 10 more, isn't going to be an issue. The only thing that happens then is we're going to have two more video rooms. So we're going to have five rooms. That may, gives us more potential for more videos, but more YouTubers also simply means that each YouTuber gets to do one or two less videos. Hmm. In the end, we'll have more videos overall, but it's not a problem if Glenn Frick or Robert Baker or whoever ends up with a video less because someone else got to make one. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> you know why? Let's, because there, I still haven't gotten through. Uh, over uh, you know. They're still coming out. TC yeah. Electronics alone did 70. 70 wow. videos. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. so much content that came out of that, it's impossible but, to but, even go but through here's it. here's the other thing. Of course, don't tell him, okay? Mark, don't tell him. But of course, I want Dave Friedman there. Don't tell him, okay? <laughs> I, I'll turn off his mic. Hang on a second. Have a good bargaining position. Here, me, here, I'm not listening. <laughs> who, who do you but, um, but, um, for example, Ref. A, awesome stuff. B, Ref has made their whole brand only because of YouTube. They know it. They love us. And when I mentioned this idea to Derek, from the first second, he's like, I'm in. It was never, never any convincing him. He got it from the first second. He supported me. He what, showed are up. They lo they're located in Europe? Uh, in Canada. Oh. He, he had to come from Canada. It cost him quite a bit of money to do this. Oh, wow. And, I didn't realize uh, that. Okay. And, and he brought a buddy. And that wasn't in the budget, so he had to spend extra money on him for food and all this. It cost him quite a bit of money. So if Derek says, I want to be there again, I can't possibly, someone who, who believed in this project, in, 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 this, in this whole thing from the first second, I can tell him, well, now I, now I got other brands that want to be there. Sorry, Derek. I'm, I'm a loyal guy, and I think Gitcon should be loyal, at least in part, to some of the brands that were there and never questioned the concept from the first second. So I think they should definitely be, be considered to, you know, come back. At least some of them. Yeah, yeah, well, you have to, you know, there's people you have to have, like, regardless, right? Um, by the way, um, we have a suggestion here from Ice Coffee Tones. They want to know, can you have mud wrestling with guitar solos at a... <laughs> and, and make it like Survivor Germany. <laughs> yeah, that might. There's, that definitely might. Lot, there's definitely a lot of potential for stuff that we haven't even done. Um, I my my personal highlight. The thing is, I haven't seen a lot of videos that came out of here. I didn't know what was done in the rooms. I was running around trying to make things work, and hey, my audio doesn't work. Can you fix this? Hey, this this card was formatted the wrong way. I can't read it in my PC. I was trying to make it work, so I don't quite know everything that came out of there. Um, my personal favorite was uh, the fight between Colin Scott and me. Did you guys see that? I did not. Okay, there's a video on my channel called The Fight. It's only five minutes. It was at, at one of the live streams. Um, you should watch that. Uh, the, the topic for the live uh, discussion was supposed to be, is the electric guitar dead? And my position on that was, look, I'm bringing all these guitar nerds here. We're doing a guitar thing all week. Why would we possibly give this any Discussion. time? Right. It's stupid. So I invited Phil Exop and Pete Thorne and a couple other guys just to talk about something else. But we left once the last seat was open. And then Colin Scott comes up, the mad Scotsman, half drunk, beer in his hand, and argues, of course it's dead. And I tell him, no, 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 you, you, you can't say that. You're not allowed to have that opinion here. Get off my stage. And it spirals into a um, wild argument with very Scottish, don't know what he said, no idea, uh, insults <laughs> thrown at And then um, uh, I'm calling him a stupid, drunk Scottish leprechaun. <laughs> on knowing that leprechauns are Irish, but being... Being ignorant about someone's culture is very insulting. So uh, then he, we, we stand up and we get in each other's faces. Really? Wow. Really close, like fist fighting. And he calls me a stupid Lederhosen schnitzel. Um, and the, the best thing is Phil X 
his face being pale, him being Phil almost pulled Colin off me. But at that point, <laughs> Colin, Colin breaks and Colin laughs because the whole thing was planned and staged. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no one knew it. No one, not a single person knew it other than us. And then, then we laugh and we're like, and scene, thank you. And then <laughs> Phil, you have to watch Phil. Phil X is like, he has no idea what's going on. And he, he, got, was, he got it uncomfortable. He was, he, he told us later, he was this close to pulling him off me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny as hell. But that's the shit I, I, that, I enjoyed getting together with some new friends that I only knew from YouTube and just doing being a prank. Silly. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I, you know, I think I saw the uh, the promo or whatever. I saw the uh, you know the whatever the thumbnail for it, but I never got a chance to watch it. So I need yeah, to watch it's, it. It's, it's, I, I cut it out on my channel. It's called uh, the fight. <laughs> yeah, that was something. Yeah. I, I, I the one one video that I saw that was interesting was also the um, there was a lot of it was one of the first videos that came out of GitCon, and it was Jason McNamara with the Tone King. Oh, yeah that that took three hours of my time. How so? Because I'm the guy who made GitCon work, so uh, I knew I I heard in the morning Jason posted a video from his hotel room that he was going to do it. I'm like Jason, don't do it. I, I was thinking that to myself. Don't do it. Come on. Lewis is such a nice guy. And Jason is an, an Aussie, and he's a loud mouth. He's a super nice dude. Oh, but, yeah, Jason's a great dude. But he can easily be misunderstood because he's an Aussie loud mouth. And um, I, I love him. He has been so supportive in the whole running up to, towards GitCon. And anything he could do from Japan, he was going to do. Jason's mm -hmm. a great guy. He is. And, um, but Lewis obviously took what Jason said, which was very insulting. If you don't know that he's an Aussie loudmouth, okay, because he Jason didn't mean it the way that it sounded. Um, of course, Lewis was insulted, but he kept his cool. But then I walked up to him later, and later that day, and I, I asked him about it because uh, I, I saw someone watching that video. I'm like, oh my god, he actually did it. So I walked up to Lewis, and he was cool. He just said, well, what would have been nice, you know, if Jason would just apologize for doing that. Um, and then I talked to him about it, and then I said, I go talk to Jason. But I didn't have an opportunity to do that. And as I stand around, I see that Jason's over at Lewis's. And without me having to put the two together, he he already did that. And I walk over there, I'm like, what's what's up with you guys? And they're like, I oh, know, it's all good. It's all figured out. We're buddies. Mm -hmm. And they really grew closer. So um, uh, I, I thought I would have to play daddy and kind of, you know, make him make up. But no, they did it themselves. Didn't even... As the organizer of this event, you don't want any tension. Drama. You don't want the right, drama. Right. Yeah. drama. Which, which is the reason why there was one company, one big American amplifier company, with, without naming any names, um, that doesn't do anything with YouTubers, tells YouTubers, oh, we'll send you an amp and you can send that back. And you have 20 days to do a video. And we also don't pay you. Okay, um, <laughs> we, and that company almost sued one of my YouTuber friends for a video that he did. Um, and they all of a sudden voiced an interest to be there. So I'm like, so so I, I make this event happen, the event for YouTubers. It's all supposed to be, we're all good and we make connections and we continue in the future of making more com more videos for the companies that we're now friends with. So you want to come get a lot of videos done and then never call us again and benefit from my event? I'm like, hell no. If you invite this company, I'm out. I said this very clearly. Um, mm. Because wh wh what would that look like? They'd be there. They possibly sued one of my friends that's there. Mm -hmm. And what they just like go at each other or they, you know, exchange meaning, mean glances throughout the room. We don't want that. Every we all want to be friends there. That's yeah, it. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, and again, going back to keeping it small, keeping it intimate, you don't have to have everybody there. You know, it's not NAM where they're going to they're going to let every right, exactly. It's the anti NAM. Complete opposite. Um hey, you know yeah, what? Let, so let, let's go to the uh, chat if you don't mind, Henning. Go 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 go. Yeah, cuz we've got 
we actually have uh, 182 people watching right now. So, Dave, your, I think your theory about um, Sunday Sunday is pretty good because there's a lot of people watching today. Now, it could be just because Henning has you know, got a lot of pull, but I don't know. Um, but uh, I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna jump into the chat and just say hi to a few folks. Uh, we got Quentin James. Hey all, what's going on, Quentin? Uh, Cheddar Kung Pao. Um, let's see, Mr. Alatube Carolyn E. Is that one of your friends? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh... Oh, I thought oh, you said uh, Carolyn. That's uh, she's a Carolyn. Are, are you still 17, 18? She's a guitar, guitar girl. Oh, okay. She cool. calls a lot of my. Carolyn is actually the one that answers all the questions that uh, uh, everything she knows how to answer, she'll do my, my job and she'll actually answer people's comments and questions for me. And uh, that is absolutely oh, amazing. Oh, please come back to our show. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, ask, that'll help. Because we don't do a very good job of that. <laughs> if, people, if people ask like about an amp or a guitar or anything that I've used before and she knows all the videos, she'll go and She'll answer that, and I, I, I come to the comment, I'm like, oh, Carolyn already answered that. That is so nice. That's very cool. I actually need to get her in here for a video. That would be awesome. And she's in Germany, so... Uh, oh, well, that's easy. Get that happening. There you go. So we got Scott Miller. Happy Sunday, gentlemen. Thank you. Insane 8, hello from Wales. Nice. Hello. Uh, Nico Pine Apples. Nico Pine Apples, maybe? Hi. Um, let's see. Uh, William Hernandez. I'm going to keep jump going down, see if we have any questions. Uh, Spot MFD, uh, Larry and Music. Um, oh, thank you. Best YouTube channel ever. Thanks, guys. Cheers from Sweden. Thank that's you. Freak that's freaking awesome. Love that. Um, Cheddar Kung Pao, everybody hit the thumbs up button, please. Yeah. Please. <laughs> wait, 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 wait a second. I have, to, uh, I have to do this for Marco Malatin right there. Right there, Marco. For you, okay. Marco is, Marco is an insane guy. He's a crazy Serb, and he was one of the GitCon helpers. He is one of the hardest working people you've ever seen. He drove 14 hours on his own dime from Serbia to work for no money for like how many days? It wasn't 10. It was 11 or 12 days straight, 16 hours a day. Um, he actually, I know he doesn't want me to say this, he sold his pedal board so that he could be at GitCon for no money and work his ass off. Wow. And one night, we're going back to the hotel. We ended uh, the setup a little bit early. I said, we need to relax a bit. And we went to the pool at the hotel. And so we're sitting in the pool. And after like 20 minutes, he's like, I can't do this. I need to be productive. I can't just like sit around, not do anything. That I, I feel useless right now. <laughs> so this is one of the hardest working people <laughs> You've ever seen a great guitar player, and without him and Michiel and Bo and Harry and Vlad, uh, and of course Kiana, this thing would have never happened. In insane people, so uh, I hate you too, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> very nice, very nice. Um, someone says uh, Nico Pine Apple says Henning's amazingly funny. So <laughs> <laughs> Look, funny looking. That's what he means. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It got cut off there on the channel. It got cut off there. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Richard Boyer, Polly's video for the Boss ES8 is one of the best there is. Yes, it's long. That's what she said. But I learned a lot. How, how many parts was that? How many parts did you do for the ES8? Uh, I, did, I did ten, and I never got into MIDI. <laughs> we never even touched on MIDI. <laughs> I remember I remember because I, 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 I had actually after that when they first came out, I had a question for you about it. And I'm like, how the heck do you do this? So I just messaged you and you just told me. I, yeah, it doesn't I, make I, any I, sense, right? No, it doesn't. No, <laughs> no. Boss asked me the boss tech support in Germany asked me questions about it. But <laughs> I stopped after 10. MIDI was I, I could have done a lot of stuff on MIDI. There was, it could have been a 20 video series easily, but after 10 videos of over an hour that again, boss would have had to spend quite some money on if they had produced it themselves. I never really got any, hey, well done, you know, from Japan or something, or hey, that's kind of cool. Or we'd like your input on some of the things that you criticize, so, nothing. 
Not even one email. Hmm. So I'm have like, you ever, have you ever reached out to Yoshi at Kagami? Uh, nope. I, I, I mean, I'm in Germany, so my go-to guys are the people from the distributor or Boss Germany, Boss England, or whatever. So getting to the, you know, they they'll block that off. They're like, oh, we talk to them. So. It, it just bugs me when the actual company that I do this stuff for, and all these ES8 videos, I, I just did. I didn't get paid for that. I just did because I thought they were necessary to do. Um, it would have been just kind of neat to get a thumbs up at least. Would have been nice. Hey, Boss Japan, or from the guy who made the damn thing. Hey, thumbs up, or let's Skype. Mm -hmm. I have ideas on switches that you wouldn't believe because the concept of this thing is amazing. If they take it and develop it a little bit further, and I can give them a point on point to point, like what needs to be done to make this the most amazing switcher on the market. Um, but hey, don't talk to me. That's also okay. Yeah, talk well, to maybe, Dave. Maybe, maybe you should talk to uh, Musicom Labs. Okay, I, I haven't worked with them. I did give all these ideas to another company, which I don't know if they're working on it, but I had a Two hour discussion with one of their very, very, very tall gentlemen um, uh, at Musique Messer once. I told him this would be the switcher that will kill every other switcher. And I gave him my whole product because I don't make products. I don't care. If I have ideas, take them. Mm -hmm. I just want good products to be out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, yeah, Boss uh, never really. I don't know if they. I think they focused on when I say when I was sitting in the videos and the damn thing was not doing what it's supposed to do, and I'm bitching about the user interface, which one should because it sucks. Um, I think they focused on that. They focused on the negative, instead of wow. seeing here's someone that actually thinks it's a it's a great product if it was just developed a little bit further. No, they focused on me saying this sucks. Well, you can see both sides, I guess, but in the end, I mean, you spent. You said you made 10 videos each an hour long. That's a pretty significant yeah. amount of time. So uh, it's interesting. I think if you yeah. went to a different, I don't know, if you went a different route, um, if you, I think if you spoke to Yoshi, it might be different. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, yes, you, there's three different kind of companies. Companies that don't do YouTube at all and they don't see the point. Okay. There's companies that will only work with you if you're all positive. Mm. I can't do that because I don't work for the company. I work for my viewers. Mm -hmm. And here's the pitch that I have to the companies. If you pay me to make a video, you're paying A, for the production time and the gear that I use, B, for my limited experience, and uh, C, for the airtime to my viewers. Because that's what I've established and that I sell. I do not sell my evaluation of the product. See, there's two different things. There's a review and there's a demo. Yeah. Right? And, and I review. You review. You're not doing a demo of the product. You're doing a review. And that includes your opinion of the product. And it's only my opinion. I've reviewed things where I, where I you know, gave my two cents and I said, I don't like this and this and this. But there's people to whom these things, these negative points might be positive points or to whom these points don't matter. Okay, because they don't use it the way that I would use it. And so it's really just, at this point, my opinion. Um, in terms of user interface or whatever, or sound, some people like really, yeah, fucked up sounds, I said it. Um, <laughs> and and I, I like sounds very nice and controllable. But hey, they hurt the sound and then they make up their own mind. And then I give them my opinion and they can take it or leave it. Yeah. But there's companies that are awesome because they want that. And then they talk about it and possibly even develop the next product with some of that in mind. Mm -hmm. And well, sure, I want to know. Then that's I, awesome. I, I want to know if something, something is messed up or something got missed or you found a problem in something or a, a flaw or something. I want to know about it so I can fix the problem or the next yeah. product, make sure that that doesn't happen. Like... um. I know that Orange, for example, uh, they're great about it. They want to know exactly what I think. And I had some comments about that stereo combo that I tested. And they're like, oh, yeah, we, we didn't think about that. It would be necessary to have these and these features. Um, good point. We'll, we'll talk about it. Now, they might not implement it on the, on the next product because who am I? But at least there's a discussion about it internally. And they don't get on my case about critiquing that. 
Right, um, or take, take the video down and we're going to see you or that kind yeah. of, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I just hung out with Aaron from Victory Amps at the at the show at Musico T for two days. And um, he's like, no, dude, we want to know all these things. Like, we'll only get better if, I mean, what I'm doing technically when I'm critiquing something, I'm starting the comment section. And that comment section is market research for any manufacturer. If you sit down and you read comments under your product's video, mm -hmm. you can see, do these comments mirror what I said? Are they arguing with me? Are they saying, yeah, but I think you're wrong about this. You're getting something that back in the day cost quite a bit of money to have a company it's do for you. Market does. That, that's what I do for a living. <laughs> that's what I do for a living. I do market research. Um, I don't do it in the community, in the, uh, guitar or music industry, but I do it in healthcare, but, but yeah, and, it, and it's expensive. That work is expensive to get that kind of research. So get that included in the review of the product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's companies who get that, get it and companies that don't get it. And I love what, what happened with us, Dave, that sounded, yeah. I love what happened with us. Was that um, at the donk? That was at the donkey farm. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> I'm going to go on record as I did not go to the donkey farm. <laughs> next year, next year. No, um, let that me... Was that let's, was Phil. No, it wasn't Phil. It wasn't Phil. Me, uh, <laughs> can you see this? Yeah, let me... Hang on. Let me, I'm going to get put that on there. Yeah, put, the, put, that, put that on there. So I sat here for a day and filmed the review of this. Now it's Watch a boost, this, okay? Yeah. And... Uh, it's supposed to, you know, push an amp to be more of what it is. And I have the amazing luxury here to have this amp heat switcher. And so I sent this through eight different amps, which I'm going to just say probably no other reviewer would do. And if you hear this with one amp, that's good and you get an idea. But I wanted to make the video where you get the full idea of what this can do with the whole bunch of apps. And uh, I post the video online and Dave writes me, because the critique doesn't just go one way, it goes both ways. And Dave Reitzman says, uh, yeah, it's not supposed to sound like that with some amps. And we found out that the amp heat switcher's buffer, right, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is not designed to handle as much output input well, as this well, one. Well, let me, let me explain. It, it, it's designed to handle a certain amount. Yeah. But this boost pedal, especially in the settings that you were using, which was were uh, the the boost level knob was quite boosted. Now and then, you and add then, the EQ then. in. Now those are boost. You had the mids up three quarters of the way or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is which is a nut more dB even. So potentially this pedal can you know take a, a guitar signal and literally boost it past line level. Yeah. So a lot of buffers, not every, not all. Uh, can only take a certain amount of level if they're designed primarily for guitar level. Mm -hmm. um, so the problem that we found is this one in the settings that you were using was pushing the amp heat buffer too much. In most conservative settings, it would be fine, but it was just pushing it where it sounded like it was uh, cutting off and like blocking distortion where it was, where it was yeah. just like pulsing, almost pulsing. And so we, uh, and I I'm like, I'm like going. I, it shouldn't sound that way into the Vox. It shouldn't sound that way into the Morgan. I, I that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I, I thought it was the pedal. That was the thing. I thought the pedal at that setting into the Vox and the Morgan yeah, had no. that, which was me therefore re misrepresenting what Dave had designed because I was using it with something that you know was in between. Well, how would um, you know? You, I mean, you're not gonna know. Well, I, I oh, I, he found I, out. I, <laughs> I, I, and also Dave in his very subtle way wrote and the JCM was set up like shit um, so if anyone else tells me that I might get a little bit offended in the back of my mind I'm going like yeah of course because I don't know how to set up a JCM but if Dave Friedman tells you you set up the JCM like shit you'll swallow that and you just go like please tell me how to set it up, oh, Mr. Friedman, because <laughs> where, where else can you learn up how to set up a JCM correctly? Uh, right. So um, then he tells me what to do. And for me, that simply meant another day of work, taking that video down, which, again, I, it was my fault that it mis misrepresented the product. Um, and I shot the whole thing again, this time I think twice as long. Um, but if you really want to know what this thing sounds like with 
eight different amps, that's the video to watch. Yeah. But the critique, that's the thing, the critique goes both ways. I mean, obviously I never want to misrepresent a product, mm -hmm. um, but I love, I love that. It, it made the video better, and I hope now it shows the pedal the way that you know you want well, it to I, sound. I, th I think ultimately too, like anytime you do um, distortion overdrive or fuzz pedals or anything like that, you might want to take that into consideration uh, and just eliminate that that is as much of a pain in the ass as it is. Just eliminate that factor, just because uh, there's a lot of fuzzes out there that put out an insane amount of level, also. And, uh, and, and, and maybe some drives and stuff too. So, you know, you're I, really I, pushing it. I've never had, uh, I'm always very conservative with my level and I usually sit here with the remote switch back and forth and I, I never really had a major problem of saying, okay, this amp doesn't handle it, but here it was very apparent. So now of course I'll, I'll listen out for that. When I test the pedal with the amps, I go in through the switcher and see if it, um, Affecting if it. it if it behaves weirdly, if it does, then I have to take that input stage of the switcher out of the equation. Yeah. But the cool thing was because of that, uh, Dave talked to uh, uh, Peter from Ampete, who now knows that hey, maybe yeah. that he's he's looking up. he's looking into that and saying he said he said it might not actually be the buffer circuit; it could be the FETs that do the switching, uh, uh, do the actual switching of the front end stuff. So he he's going to look at that. But it, it made all of us m smarter. I know for, for future videos what I have to watch out for. I know how the JCM should be set up. Um, you know. <laughs> I want to learn now, even though I, uh, I don't have a JCM 800. I used to have a JCM 800. Which one is that that you have? Is it the reissue or uh, an original? It's, uh, it's, it says Marshall on it. That's <laughs> <laughs> Is it an older one or a newer it be, one? It would be the same either way. It would be the same it, either way? Yeah. Well, Wait, I mean, uh, the, it's that one right there. It's, it has a golden front yeah. and muscle. Pro probably a reissue. Yeah. With the vertical inputs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I had a 2203, so. I, I don't know. Um, it's, it's, it's going back because I would, I mean, I'd like to keep it here so that, um, for the for the videos, I can always switch to it and show how a boost or overdrive, you know, pushes that amp. But I would have to buy it, at least for cost, which means I would have to buy an amp from Marshall. I don't know. I wouldn't buy that. I I I, I could get a Friedman, but the thing. But here's the thing. Here's the weird thing. If I told people in my videos, I'm going to show you how this pedal behaves with a Marshall type amp. I'm going into the Friedman, whatever is close enough to the JCM. No, it's they not. Still, they <laughs> still wouldn't see that logo. They still wouldn't see the logo they want to yeah, see. Yeah. They go like, yeah, but it's not the... Because that's how people are. They want to see that logo. Mm -hmm. they, they, and they think that it makes it so much better because it has that logo. You can't make a video for every manufacturer that people want to hear a pedal come out of. I mean, it's just impossible. So. Well, it would be nice to have the basics. I have a, an, an AC30 or probably like, you know, I like the AC40 from Morgan. So I have an AC, AC30 type amp. Um, I have something that, that's twinish. I have something, you know, I want something Marshallish. I want something orangish because that's definitely a different kind of voicing. Uh -huh. so, that when, so that people get kind of the whole picture of what the pedal can do. If anything, it, if I were if I were you, I'd I'd get rid of the eight hundred and get like a DSL or something from Marshall on that and just play well, it. Well, I, I think uh, honestly, the 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 uh, I mean the amps for demoing pedals. I think that the the amps to have would be you know your Fender type circuit, meaning a mm -hmm. deluxe or twin or something. Um, your Vox type circuit, which you have. Um, yeah. but JSA main hundred is actually a, a great, uh, one for if you're going to show with the pedal, what the pedal does into a dirty amp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. so with the 800, it's, it's just, you know, with the gain on 10 on an 800 or on eight or something, which is really the only settings, because if you turn the, 
turn the gain down too much, it gets very thin on an thin, 800. Yeah, no bass. Um, yeah. So with that on 10, that's what people started with, and then they always used to boost them with, like, you know, back in the 80s or something, it would be that with boosted with a super overdrive or a tube screamer or, or, or something along the lines of that. And that's a valid thing that, that people still like and still do. Um, um, so that's a great amp, actually, to show that. You know, a, a vintage style Marshall would be a great amp to have too, like a Plexi style. Mm -hmm. Which um, is uh, exactly what I need to talk to you about. And since you're here, I might as well talk to you about that. Um, <laughs> because I, uh, well, let me put it this way: the the Dirty Shirley and the BE, mm -hmm. they're on loan, um, yeah. but you're not getting them back. You have to come and pry them from my cold dead hands. Um, so just to let you know, okay, I'm in Germany. Na 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 na. Um, <laughs> so the dirty Shirley, not smiling though. The dirty Shirley is staying. I didn't. Right. I'm, I'm smiling because I didn't send him to him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, the dirty Shirley is just insane, and I'm gonna love using that to, you know, push it with something else. But you can also get it cleanish, but that's not why you get that. The BE, of course, you can get clean and really mean, but um, I have one issue with the BE. Let me, let me. I, I need to use all my angles here because I set up the cameras and it's uh, it, it's stupid to uh, you know not use them. There it is. Um, so the problem with the BE is you can clearly see that where it is right now, it's just very big, and it <laughs> looks unbalanced in that rack. The only way I could get it in that rack is I, un, I, I took the feet off the Laboga, mm -hmm. so that has no feet, and the BE doesn't have a handle anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only way I could put it in there. And if you see it in the, in the app rack, uh, yeah, well, that's, what, that's what I need to talk to you about, because A, the one solution you're thinking of, and at Musique Productif, Dennis, their guitar guy, was like, B is amazing, but play the small box. And he said the small box is the amp that he would get if he got one Friedman amp, and it's the amp that made him a better guitar player. And last night he took me into his room, mm -hmm. and he showed me. And everyone in the room, some people from other amp manufacturers as well, everyone's jaw dropped when he showed us what he did, where he had this guitar and he just played subtly and it was a really spanking cleanish sound and then he could control the game with his playing but in a dynamic way that i've never had with any other amp mm. and i took the guitar and i could literally from note to note go from clean to scream and all with my playing uh that was impressive he said it's the best plexi style amp that he's ever played and he suggested that i don't have the be but I have the small box, so they're so similar. What do you think about that? Good, 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 uh, good suggestion. Um, the high gain channel on the on the small box is very similar to the the standard BE channel. Uh, the the power section is a little different. It's uh, it's a little lower filtering, so it has a little squishier kind of feel to it. Um, the Plexi channel, everyone loves channel one of that, which is just slight. If you gain on ten, it's just slight breakup. If you smack it hard with the with a uh, humbucker guitar. If you play lightly, though, it's clean. If you roll it off just a little bit, it's clean. Um, that actually would be a good platform also for testing things and pedals and yep. stuff, especially on exactly. either or channel. Um, that would be great. Um, another option is the new BE50 Deluxe. Which I just saw today. Yeah, that, which that is pretty versatile and pretty epic sounding but it does not have that plexi channel so see this is a problem <laughs> but, don't, but it has an amazing uh, it has a bucks and betty clean channel i know you like that it has what it has a, what, a what, bucks what, 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 what? and betty clean channel Wait, and it's the same transformers and everything used in the bucks and betty so he's salivating you know it just doesn't have the reverb sorry but but but, but, but. <laughs> see, this is this gets complicated now. So what, you, see, what I'm saying is what you really need is a small box and the BE50. 
<laughs> so you're going to have to actually, in that rack, you're going to just have to take the other one out. So that means I have or the Dirty Scotty and the Small one. and the BE50. Yeah. And I can take the Laboga out, but that means that I have, then I have three Friedman amps in the rack. I mean, is that a good idea? Well, I, think I don't so. know. Is it? Sure, why not? I think it's a great idea, personally. Because the Bucks and Betty is... Literally one of the best clean sounds I've ever played. I have wet dreams about the Box and Betty clean sound. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I, I have actually. To say, yeah, I have to say, at, at the trade show, I showed the uh, um, Rev Dynamis, the Dynamis 740. That uh, that clean channel is insane. I played that with the McMull Strat, and people just. I played clean, mm -hmm. two days, and people kept stopping at the booth and just seeing what I did. Uh, it, it was phenomenal. But the Box and Betty two years ago at NAMM, that insane. That's beautiful. So that's built in there, huh? Yeah. That's in the BE50. Well, quick question for you, Dave. On the BE that Henning has, couldn't he take the S switch, back off the gain on that, and then it would become more like more the Flexi? More like the Flexi, yes. Yeah, a little, a little different still, but more like it. Yes. Yeah. So Henning, if you you know the S switch on the front of that BE, if you took off the gain, you backed it right. off. It would right be more, that. yeah, that would be more like the the small box if you backed off the gain. Not like you said uh, on small be, box channel one. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah well, small box small box channel one with that switch in the middle, maybe with the gain backed off some, maybe where you have it should be just a crunchy light crunchy kind of thing so mm -hmm. it definitely backs off a lot of the gain and makes it more plexi-ish but will i get to that brilliant dynamic sound that the small box has on channel one well you know channel uh, yeah maybe not exactly no it was it was a revelation i gotta say this it was just i mean obviously you have to play very subtly with the with the volume yeah. on full, you played solidly, but it was it was very clean. Mm -hmm. And then you get wind, bam, and play that big chord, and you were like right there in rock heaven. And I I I I did solo stuff, just you know bluesy stuff, and I could control every note's drive with yeah. my with my playing. Mm -hmm. um, it, that obviously I know dynamic amps, I know how to work with the volume, but that kind of control was insane. Um, I'm sure we can work something out. Yeah, I, I definitely do. So um, <laughs> the, the new the new BE50 Deluxe, what's the price range on that? Uh, it is, uh, well, the, the, the normal street map price is $34.99. Because yeah. it actually has more features than the actual BE100. Mm -hmm. Just so it, less lots. Is it, so really, it's just two less... Slightly smaller transformers, two less tubes, and two less sockets. So that's, you know, for anyone who's wondering why it's expensive, well, it's really the same thing. <laughs> I, by, by taking two tubes out, two sockets out, and slightly smaller transformers, I don't save that much money. Not that much. Yeah. Plus, it has a box and Betty in it. Yeah. Yeah. And, then it also and, has and, and, and the HBE channel is different, and the... Um, it has an it independent, has a, independent. A response knob. And a, a and a, a thump knob. So a thump knob is like a resonance knob, and and response knob is variable negative feedback. So you can really kind of morph the amp into what all sorts of sounds out of it. It's very versatile. But the um, BE, the thing that I love also is the uh, the HBE has an independent volume and and gain, yeah, which is super cool too. It's a great amp. It's look, it looks awesome. Um, I'm going to jump back in the chat. Oh, you know what? I'd love to go back to that discussion that we had earlier, um, Henning, uh, because someone said about a beginner. We were talking about beginners. And uh, Felipe TM says, as a beginner, I have to say that Henning's channel has been very, really, really useful to understand things like amps, pedals, and even the guitars themselves. So th that might make you feel good. That is a uh, that is very nice. I just uh, we talked about earlier um, that at the uh, the trade show where was someone asked me he he really liked the amp and said how can I can I just plug this into my Blues Junior? He was talking about the head, yeah. And um 
that just showed me that, you know, I, I don't want to say the guy was stupid. He wasn't, but he was a beginner. Uh, I was mid twenties, but he was just a beginner of guitar. Mm. And uh, he didn't understand the concept at all. He didn't, he didn't even know there was the foot switch for the amp and they, I had a pedal board built with a couple of pedals and he didn't, and he, he didn't understand that the pedal board was not part of the amp. And he, he asked me, what's the difference between the foot switch and the pedal board? He just did everything he saw was foreign to him. Mm -hmm. And there's a big, uh, uh, not danger. Yeah, let's say that. Uh, a big possibility that with what we do in these videos, because we're so versed in the terminology and everything, is not addressing people that, that don't know these things. Now, if I do explain every single thing in every video, am I patronizing to the people that do know that? Are they gonna go, of course we know that. But maybe not everyone does. I, there's, there's a lot that I did. I mean, I know knew nothing when I started playing guitar. And there's still a lot that I don't know now, like a lot. And I wish people would explain things to me as mm -hmm. if I don't know things because I don't. <laughs> no, it's, it's, hey, look, I mean, everybody starts off from scratch and are going to feel like uh, they, they, they need to learn everything. And, and it's great to have someone to teach them. Um, I think that it would be good to have some element of things for beginners in videos. Um, but you can't have it in, a, in every video starting from scratch because yeah. it's just going to be it's not patronizing. It's just how much time can you spend on that each time saying, OK, well, I'm going to go over the basics of everything here. This is what gain means and why, you you know, like yeah, I know you can't do that on everything. You're right. Um, I do that on compressor videos usually where I explain what a compressor does, because especially with the compressor, um, it's tough to do these videos because a lot of it is felt, not necessarily heard. Um, and a lot of guitar players don't understand why do I need a compressor? Because technically, if I play distorted, well, the amps, dis the distortion is compressing. So as, as soon as I have a distorted sound, it's kind of really doesn't need a compressor anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's always justifying what you need it for, why you need it, what does threshold do? It took me years to understand really what a compressor does and why attack and why release and what's the ratio. So I really feel that these are things I need to explain in every compressor video. And I'm getting very tired of it, but I think it's necessary. I would agree with you. And you know what? It's coming out of GitCon. There was a great video with, um, was it with Robert Keeley? Yeah. And he, he ex yeah. I think there was, and he explained compressors. Mm -hmm. uh, probably with uh, Juan Alderete. Yeah, it was, it was a great video. I, you know, I got I got a lot out of that. Just you know, he was talking about different the different types of compressors, and uh, you know, I don't know any. Again, I'm not going to go into it because it, it's you know it's lost out of my brain now. But but I definitely learned a lot. Um, and that the, the one thing I learned from it was if you hear the compressor changing your tone, then you're setting it wrong. That, that's at least what one of the things that they were saying. Like you know, you don't want it. You don't want to hear it change your tone. It's supposed to be like a more of a feel thing. At least, at least that's what they were saying. I, I think there's three types of compressors. There's the, um, the this thing here. Uh, no. Like the Keeley Compressor Plus, mm -hmm. um, which is a studio type compressor, like a, let's say 1176. See, I'm already saying stuff that no one knows what I'm talking about. Like the... <laughs> Universal Audio has Dave, one. Dave, Dave knows what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, one of the compressors that's being used on vocals and kick drums and snare uh, since the 70s. 60s or no, 70s. Um, the 1176. Um, you see them in studios. It's a black thing. Mm -hmm. uh, two, two big knobs. And that's kind of a thing like this, where you have a lot of control with attack and release and ratio and the knee and all these compressory studio things. That kind of aims at compressing your signal without you actually hearing it. Mm -hmm. It's compressed, it's longer, I can control how much sustain I have and all this, but I'm not really hearing something happening. It's a subtle kind of, there's more of it, but I don't really know why. 
Then there's a compressor, <laughs> my favorite compressor right now on the market. Wagner. The Lindhurst. That's the one that I use that's a clean, I call it a clean compressor. You have a little bit less uh, things to, you have a ratio control, that's nice. But you have the switch where you can boost the high end. So you want those sparkling, ging, 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 you know, appreciated chords and they're just fendery, sparkly mm. clean. This just, A, holds the notes longer, but also um, makes the attack very clanky and you have the highs emphasized. And I, this for clean stuff is just insane. Mm. Uh, that's the second kind of compressor. You really hear it changing your tone in a attacky, different attacky kind of sense and the notes are longer and brighter. And then there's the one that uh, right now I have on the board that I took to the trade show, the uh, Keeley Compressor Plus, which as a compressor to do this or this, I wouldn't use it. But it's the kind of compressor where you crank up the level, so the makeup gain, and it pushes your amp, and it's actually more of a boost. So it's compressing, yes, it can, it's making your signal louder, but that's actually one of the best boosts I know, because you can really just crank it all the way up, put it in front of an amp, and that amp will all of a sudden start to scream. Hmm. So you can use a compressor as a, as a boost as well. It'll change your sound, because it'll, it's not the same sound anymore like you would have with this, but it's, it's a great boost. And that's why I like the, the Compressor Plus, because it really does that really well. As a compressor for this kind of, kind of application, it doesn't right. do anything. So uh, you have to know why do I want a compressor and then pick the right one. Yeah, I actually, I, I wanted to get a compressor. I, I picked up the, what is it? The, uh, the Ego by Wampler. Also nice. I have the that's mini one. Impressive. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice one. Where you have that also like a, a tone switch, which w what it'll do is it'll boost your high end. The uh, I have the on the mini ego. That's also one that's great for those clean sounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I use it for for clean. I that was my go to before I got this one. Yeah, they're they're great pedals, um, but that was that was definitely a good learning. So for me, um, but you know, getting back to, uh, I agree with you it's, for compressors. It's good to have that information in there. And uh, there's probably some general information you want to have for beginners, but you can't have it in there for everybody. So um, let's see. Uh, Jason Bone says, I have purchased a guitar and many pedals as a result of Henning's reviews. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, you, you, you must, Henning. You must have uh, the 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 wives and girlfriends are the ones that probably hate you the most. That's yes, probably true. At, <laughs> at NAMM, I have couples coming up to me, saying, and, and the, the guys are always like, "Yours are the only videos that she will watch with me." <laughs> Which, because maybe it's they they find it entertaining, whatever. So. Uh, uh, I, I'm not as unpopular with the ladies as you would think. And I'm playing uh, on the PlayStation right now with a, a fan of mine um, from Holland. And uh, every time we play and she's in the background, uh, she says, say hi to Henning. That's uh, She can't really hate me. Mm -hmm. There you um, go. But, but yeah, uh, it's, uh, gear gets moved because of my videos and obviously it could cause problems. That's not my fault. No, you have a disclaimer on every video. I think I saw. It's okay. I'm hated a little bit too, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, Leon Baron, hey guys, would a one by twelve be okay for a fifty watt plexi? If not, what would what would it lack? Uh, a fifty watt plexi cranked up, clean. Didn't what, say. What, what are we talking? You know, um, I would uh, imagine the fifty watt. I would. I would imagine. Um, well, first of all, what speakers in it? <laughs> because a fifty watt plexi is going to blow up a lot of speakers. So, uh, crank cranked into a one twelve. If you're playing it clean, well, that's a different story. You could put but, a clean, um, or sixty five. Would it work? Would it work? Yeah, it would work. Uh, I, yeah, maybe the seventy five watt cream back. Mm. Um, um, because. 
the sixty fives. I've had a bunch of them. Actually, people blow them up. Uh, yeah, you were saying that. I quite a few actually. Um, not sure why that is either, but that's a question for Celestian if you're out there. Um, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, uh, uh, two things before it disappears. Uh, we backtracks says something about my Gambali guitar, and apparently he made me an offer about it. I don't remember that. Please write me again. I don't think your offer was too low. That guitar needs to go. It's ugly and orange, and it's over there. So uh, <laughs> make me um, an offer again. <laughs> exactly. It's ugly and orange, and it needs to go. It, it's a, it's a classic guitar. It's good it's from the nineties. It's a, but it's like it, it's not in this room, so it, it's just hanging on a wall in there. If he wants it, he can have it. Um, but talking about speakers, people always go, "Oh yeah, they have the cream backs, or they have the whatever the seventy five H something." And what I usually do is I just like yeah 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 yeah, because I have no idea what that means. None, <laughs> zero. I was just like, I usually admit when I don't know things. But in that case, I go like, yeah, 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 I don't know what these numbers mean and cream bags, green bags, vintage 30s. I know vintage 30 is something that's been used a lot. Can I tell you how they sound compared to a cream bag, something hemp cone? I don't know. How would I know that? <laughs> well, you need I mean, to sit in a room with a lot of Celestians. <laughs> that's true. Well, I'd, I'd you can kind of know that. If if you have the Celestian IRs, you can put them all in your in your two notes or whatever you're using for that scenario and listen to them all. The Celestian has IRs, right? Yes, good ones. Okay, then I should probably do that because the problem is when you switch through IRs, you might know what the speaker is being used in that cap, but also the cap changes. Yeah. So you have no idea. In the end, on the uh, I think the, the the studio is killer. Um, great product, but a lot of the speakers don't do it for me, especially a lot of the 412s, oh, yeah. way too big, way too fat. Um, I usually end up with a 212, um, and I, I, I like them a little bit brighter, and it's they are very few, and I have access to everything they have. I just have to mm -hmm. tell them, you know, hey, give me whatever you've got new. Um, so I just started using the ref caps, which are actually nicely voiced, but I, most of the, the, the speakers just, it's my, my ears are used to a certain sound, not mm -hmm. super, super spiky. It shouldn't have, it should never have too much bass. Um, that's also what I do in my videos. I don't mix or record like a guitar player wants to hear it. I mix a record like it would actually work in a recording situation. I don't know if people know this, but I've recorded a shit ton of albums. So... Yeah, there, there's a fine line. Yeah, there's a fine line with that. You know, like if if you're sitting in the room, and it's a YouTube video, and you're sitting in the room, and you're just playing guitar naked without any backing track or anything else. Um, I find for a lot of people, it's it's more pleasant with more bass, uh, with a little more bass and a, and a little less top end, and and it's a more of a a pleasant kind of uh, thing with just one person. Mm -hmm. We're not double tracking. We're not doing anything. Yep. Um, you know, in a track, no, it'd be totally different. You know, you you would have uh, way less bass and way brighter, uh, almost is to that, the point where you solo it and you can't believe how bright it is. The the it showed me it, he, he, best story ever. Um, Diesel VH4 pedal. I went to two guys that are very familiar with this amp. A, a uh, friend of mine here that's playing in a Metallica cover band who has a VH4 who came and brought it, so we could really compare it. So he knows that. that amp and the sound. And to Lasse Lammert, who's a uh, world-renowned metal producer, and he knows that amp, he knows the cap, and he sent me his private not-to-share impulse response that he made of the Diesel VH4 cap. So... If I have that impulse response that he uses on recordings, for me, that's the reference. But it's exactly that. It's the one he uses on recordings, which means you use that on a metal recording and it's perfect. It's exactly what you want without ever having to apply any EQ. But by itself, oh my God, it bites your head off. Mm -hmm. It is very piercing. It is that cap. It is the way it sounds. Mm -hmm. 
But by itself, what you just said, naked in a room, it's pretty horrible. Yeah. It's so horrible that Peter Dietzel, when he watched the video, said he liked it more when in the video for a couple of minutes, I went to the 412 Marshall, which was a lot more rounded off in the top end. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people said that sound is horrible and they hated how the pedal sounded in the video, even though it is the way that actually that cap sounds and it is the way that it was used in the track. No one criticized the track at the beginning. No one said yeah. it sounded bad yeah, yeah. in the track. Exactly. So this is what I'm saying, sort of. Yeah. But but uh, but also uh, also you know a diesel in general too is is can be an extremely bass heavy amp. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Extremely thick and not excessively bright. Um, so it kind of makes sense also using a diesel amp with that cabinet balances exactly. it out. You know. But I got a lot of hate for the sound in that video, which is wh why I actually made another one where I'm using the Marshall cap. But it was interesting because that was actually what I used in the video, the sound that you would want when you go in a studio. That's yeah. exactly the sound you well, want on a metal yeah. recording. Yeah, well, you, you can't, can't, you know, you can't win. And you can't win you can't. ever. You know, it's like I, I, I've always <laughs> said with videos, with videos, here's, here's, here's what happens. So you put a video out, and the first thing they say was, you know, you, you, you mic it up properly uh, with a real cabinet, uh, you know, with a um, a 57 and a blend of, a say, a Royer 121 or, or a 421 Sennheiser, a blend. Very typical, very common with what's done in the studio. In fact, 90% of what's done in the studio for a rock guitar sound. Yeah. Um, so you give, you give that to him and it's bone dry. Then you get people saying, oh, well, I don't know how that really th that sounds. I wish you would have done it with a, a uh, you know, just a mic in the room. <laughs> so then you do a video. Then you do a video with the mic in the room. And then people are saying, I wish you would have recorded it properly with a 57 and, and, and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, then, then you get someone that goes, well, I like that, but I, I wish it would have been recorded with some effects also. I then, wish you do it with, then you do it with the effects, and then they complain that there's effects on it. I wish it so, would have been recorded with single calls. I wish it would have been recorded with humbuckers. So, so, mm -hmm. so I, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, okay. So what you really need to do is when you do a video is you go, here's the room mic, here's the dry mic, here's with... <laughs> Here's with effects on it, and uh, show why all the flavors. Think... And then someone will complain that you should have used different mics. Mm -hmm. why, why do you think my videos are now like twenty five minutes for an overdrive? Mm -hmm. Because I at least I go through everything, and then depending on the pedal, I use one or two guitars. Because you know humbucker, single chords, whatever. And then with effects and without, and it, within in a track and not in a track. Mm -hmm. um, and now that always takes time going through a whole bunch of amps, which I think is, is telling you a lot of what you want to know, but then don't complain that it's a 25 minute video because I'm giving you all this information now, whether or not, I think, <laughs> the, I think the in the room is, 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 is a stupid thing to ask for. I know people ask for that. I like it mic in the room. That tells you exactly nothing about the sound. Do you have the same cab? Yes or no? Possibly. This room will sound completely different than your practice room. It will sound completely different than any other room. Mm -hmm. And the mic I'm putting in that room is not going to be 57. A 57 is a common denominator. 57 or 609 or 906 Sennheiser. Mm -hmm. That is a common denominator. You can't say, oh, use a different mic. That's a standard. Yeah. What am I using to mic my room? There you go. It tells, another, another, yeah. tells you nothing about the sound because you don't know what these room mics sound like. Mm -hmm. then, then, <laughs> then they'll be like, I wish they just would have filmed it with an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're scratching your head, all my 4K cameras, and they're asking for an iPhone video. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the sound <laughs> in the room, if I move the, that mic up and down or where, wherever, is it in the beam of the speaker? It is pointless 
and it tells you absolutely nothing about the sound of the amp or the guitar or whatever when you're doing room sound. Mm -hmm. If you want to evaluate it that way, you have to go to a store and actually play it in the room. Yeah. You know what? And alternatively, you go to all this time and expense to get great recordings of all this stuff, and then people end up listening to these YouTube videos on their phone. And on the crapper. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so then, yeah. So then, then it comes out. The video comes out. Well, it doesn't sound that good. And then it's like, how did you listen to it? Mm -hmm. well, on my phone. Oh, right. okay. Right. Right. You got. You can't represent how the amps. Which sound is again or... what that again sort of what I think. I think honestly, we should make the videos to sound good on the phone. Because, because I, I, I mean, like literally, mix with the phone. Oh, I know. I hate to say it, but I mean, in this day and age, I mean, it's like iPads or phone. It's true. I think there's a little. I think there's actually a little, um, little app or not app, but a little plugin or something that you can actually Bluetooth to your the audio yeah. or something to your to your phone or something. My you my, um, we're talking about how room or mic'd. My argument is very simple. The only way you would ever hear your amp or whatever gear you use in the room is you experiencing it in the room as a, mm -hmm. in the practice room or as a bedroom player, whatever. Right. But the mic sound is actually the one that counts. That's the one that's going to be communicated on a recording in a live situation. No one ever experiences the amp in the room. The audience, whether on recording or live, experiences what it sounds like mic'd. So it might be that it sounds phenomenal with the cap and all this. Maybe it's a sucky cap to be mic'd. You don't know. Yeah. You know, the mic sound to me as a recording engineer and producer is literally the only thing that matters. Yeah. Oh, I agree with you. I agree with you. So, so I think that is what needs to be communicated because that's what in the end will end up recorded or live or whatever. Um, and, you know, when I played the small box yesterday through a 412 Friedman cap, it was amazing. It was big. I mean, I felt, I felt like a rock star. It was so cool. But you know what? Sadly, I can't replicate that ever here. Because I don't have a 412 Friedman cab. And oh. even if they sent over five of them, you know, and gave me 20 bucks on top of that, I couldn't put them here. I simply don't have the space to have a 412 here. And it wouldn't make sense because I'd have to mic it every single time. It, it just isn't a... I wouldn't have the pleasure of experiencing what I experienced there in the store. So I... You know, I need to know that how that amp sounds in the situation that I can use it in, which is either cap in the ISO box mic'd in, coming out of my monitor speakers, and it's never going to push me and move me like when I'm standing in no, front of the cap. Not at all. It's never. Mm -mm. Which, by the way, I have a phone to pick with you people. Um, I uh, heard there was some talk about the Gitcon guitar sounds. <laughs> okay. Um, I heard Phil X uh, saying things about things. Mm -hmm. and But here's the thing. Two things. A, things were distorting. And that wasn't the studio being crappy. It was actually the levels out of the studio. The uh, Torpedo Studio, I have to talk to Guillaume about this. Um, we had problems getting a lot of level out of the analog outs. Even the digital outs, when I use it here, it... it so you're tempted to run it relatively hot on the output. But as soon as it goes into the red, you're actually having digital clipping. And that's what actually happened at Gitcon. The problem in the 4K room was that the torpedoes were not at the station where people were editing and setting up audio because of the cable length. It had to be in the room. So whoever was actually switching the video couldn't set them up again. Mm. You know what I mean? It's They were just in the other room. So no one was monitoring those levels, and that's why we had a lot of bad clipping. And um, Phil's saying he didn't like the sound. I'm going to just say, Phil, he's a spoiled guy. 
He gets to play with actual cabs all the time. He gets to crank shit up. I had to shut him down in the main room at GitCon all the time because he went around playing stuff, cranking it up. I had I had to be the sound police saying, Phil, turn it down. <laughs> and I felt bad about telling Phil X to turn it down. Trust me. Because it but, sounds good. Well, yeah, but I mean, he knows, he gets the feeling of a real cab cranked. The three video rooms are really close to each other. So we can't have cranked caps in those rooms. It's just a no-go. If, if Glenn Frick is next door making a video, we can't be rude to him and crank, crank the cap. So that's why we had the torpedoes going into monitor speakers in the rooms, mm -hmm. which of course doesn't give you the feeling that Phil is used to. He's used to hitting that E string and getting punched in the gut. Yeah, yeah. You don't have that with the torpedo through monitor speakers. If you mic that cab and send it through monitor speakers, it would sound exactly the same. I think the torpedo is brilliant for this, but you don't get the same immediacy and the same fullness when you're sitting in front of a recording setup. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's, what he, that's what, that's what he think, experienced. He, he didn't think, experience he, what he's used to. You think he was talking about what he was experiencing live or was he talking about the post-production recording listening to a few v videos and saying oh i don't because that's how i took it as some of the video sound wasn't that good at least yeah well i, I he's fully right that uh, that there was distortion on those sounds also um i set it up i set up i mean there were six torpedoes and um that sounds like a porno <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. Thank <laughs> you. Um, I'm, no, I'm, depends, I'm depends where your mind is going. I got, I'm, I'm, I'm having visuals now. <laughs> <laughs> it was six torpedoes, and I, I set it up on preset one, which is a 1960 Marshall, whatever, which definitely isn't the perfect cap to be used with all this amps. I mean, you know, it would have been good to say, okay, we have this amp now. Let's fiddle around and find the right cap in the right settings. Yeah. But that would have also meant setup time every single time and so there's cameras to be set up and everything to be set up and then you have two amps that are set up and then we start messing around with two torpedoes finding the right caps for those two amps it's just a logistical nightmare to do this what uh two notes uh, said is they're gonna have one or two guys next time we're gonna have laptops set up with the torpedoes where you actually have the interface and they're going to take care of helping us with that. Mm -hmm. So when we have set up, they can actually do this. But what we actually want to do next year is um, even better. A lot of the setup time in the rooms was setting up amps, going in, cabling them, all this. Uh, and it took too much time. So Derek from Ref suggested something really cool. Why don't we just have three amps left, three amps right, set up in every room all the time? Like what Dave had at NAM. Yeah. Like a rack with mm -hmm. three amps on each side and an MP switcher on top. And each room simply has six amps set up. On top of it could be cables for a floater amp if you need that. But six amps set up in a room. You go in, you want to play the Friedman, you go click. Done. It would mean that, let's say, the Rev and the Houston Kettner are always in the picture. But that, only, that only opens up yeah, uh, it only op opens up possibilities for comparisons. Plus, if someone's using the ref, well, the Friedman's also in every single video. Yeah. So the more the merrier. And I think that's a really cool thing. First of all, we would start switching around things and just having fun comparing and no setup time. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to do that. Get MP switches for every room, left and right, and just have all the rooms set up. And if someone wants to play the Dirty Shirley, they'll simply have to book the room that has a Dirty Shirley already hooked up. Right. I think right. that I think that makes the most sense. Yeah, I think so. And we would definitely have to make sure to uh, set up the torpedoes to have the, the sounds. I mean, to check. I just went to preset number one, bam. Because yeah. was what I could do with the time that we had for testing everything it we probably could have gotten better sounds there 
you know, look, I, I, I think, I think Phil was live, live, live and learn, you know, yeah. so you, so you make uh, tweaks to next year's. Exactly. Yeah, no. the, the levels were a year. problem because I definitely have distortion on, on quite a few videos. And that is when you're running the, the output of the torpedo too high, which we just got this little waveform. And I'm like, no, you're always kind of about trying to get as much level out of it as possible. Why? Um, well, because we were recording analog. Yeah. And, and we had cable runs of like, you know, 10 meters. No, no, I, no I understand. I understand that. But you, on, on the... You have to keep that level that way down on the um, the two notes, and um, then just use your mic pre's level to bring it up. I would have been afraid to uh, 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 to you know to. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, well, we had good mic pre's. I think another thing, possibly, that could have been it, was that. It has the, the the studio has a, pl a plus uh, plus four minus ten was that the other way around whatever a switch in the back it might be that the audio interface was set up to the opposite you know what I'm talking about mm. so I think maybe it was just we didn't we literally didn't have the right sensitivity on the uh, universal audio right. audio interface right which I thought about later that could be it yeah yeah. Um, we have a question here from Purple Rocket six six six. Is it true that some YouTubers wanted money to come to GitCon? I shall answer that after my bathroom break. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. I give you a topic. Uh, what do you think about that? And I'm gonna go to this camera. I'll be right back. <laughs> 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 it's a nice view by the way let's see what he's got going on over here yeah he's got some nice guitars going on yeah i got the rev amp back there what's he talking about he doesn't doesn't have room for a four by 12 i don't know <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go there one day so i'll find out i'll tell you then yeah it looks like the, he can fit a couple four by 12s um yeah it's a big enough place it's a yeah he's got some nice guitars um, is that the only ball that he was talking about? The, that's not the Petrucci, the one, the third one in. I don't know. No, that's that's no not, idea. That's like some weird. I know he's got the James Valentine uh, Music Man there on the wall, which is cool. Which one? What, I no. think the James Valentine one is the one in kind of in the center, the kind of blonde looking one. Okay, gotcha. It's actually, a cool guitar. You used it in a couple of videos recently. It's very cool. Kind of like a Tele hybrid. Yeah. Kind of Very thing. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So um let's see. Let's see. Let's go into chat, and see what we got. Uh although I still want to go back to that question. Um so what do you think about his point about you know the NAM video with the YouTubers? About about them not providing any like help for the YouTubers, or about them, or about charging the companies. Charging the companies. I don't. I un totally understand that from from his point of view. I totally totally understand that. Yeah. Um, and it it's such a nominal amount of money for a larger company to 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 do. Because I mean, myself, I, I it's I wouldn't have a problem if he's talking fifty to a hundred dollars a video from all the youtubers i really wouldn't have a problem with that at all i, I just i don't see well, you're you're sort of guaranteed then that they're going to come by your booth so right, right now right now you're you're just like it's haphazard you know it's just like someone might stop by someone might want to do a video from it mm -hmm, but you mm -hmm. get two or three people maybe that that do the videos um i think at that point i'd, I'd book 10 of them right <laughs> i mean Honestly, make it really affordable. Make it $50. It's fine. Just just right. book 10 of them. Okay, it's $500. I mean, for us, that's not a big deal. We're guaranteed a lot of coverage from it. Um, yeah, so uh, good I, idea. I, I have to say hi, Phil McKnight. Hey, Apparently, Phil. He, he's like, I paid to watch Henning and he left. What? <laughs> <laughs> did he pay? Who'd he pay? <laughs> what, who'd yeah, who'd he pay? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me get my PayPal. What? Um, so that's an idea. No. That is, so what there you, we go. <laughs> what do you what do you guys think? Do you think 
YouTubers got paid? To go to GitCon? Well, that's not what they said. Is it, they, he said, is it true that some YouTubers wanted money to come to GitCon? Yeah, okay. Um, surprisingly, no. Um, I'm going to be very honest. I had a feeling that someone with like, you know, over a million subs, and there's a few that, you know, uh, I, I had on my list, um, would say, well, look, we, we are big pull, blah, 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 you know, we need to get something for it. And I, I told Hans Peter that, you know, we might have to have a little bit in the budget for someone on that level uh, to pull them in because being there for a week, of course, they can generate content, but they might also, you know, lose money. Mm -hmm. But uh, then uh, Robert Baker con uh, connected me with uh, Leo from Frog Loop Studios, and Leo's got we have what two million subs now. He had 1.6 at the time. And Leo was just like, dude, awesome. I'm coming. Didn't ask for a dime. Mm -hmm. With 1.6 million viewers, he could ask for a whole bunch of dimes. It, with anything he does, anything he does on his channel, any product, whatever, he could ask for real money because that's insane amounts of 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 clicks you can get your product seen in. Um, no, he just said, Sounds like a great thing, I'm in. And that was it. And at that point, I was like, look, if I'm not paying him, I'm not paying Anybody. any of yeah. any of these bigger yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. And we didn't have people on that level anyway. But and he's um, great. He's amazing. <laughs> he Is he guy. the one that did the uh, the video with uh, recently with Phil X soloing on it? He was solo Pete soloing? Pete, he did a oh. video with Pete. Pete, Pete, Pete was soloing on it. Oh, was it Phil? Was it Pete? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, he's he's the one that does like metal covers of songs like Adele, Hello. Yeah, and he's got you know, he takes, he takes, that or something. Yeah, and he, and you know what? I and and you know, he has a very good income stream from all of that. Um, yeah, I can imagine so. You know, because um, the views are crazy, like on 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 the and videos. He sells, the, he sells the music on iTunes and all that. I mean, yeah. he makes good money, but he could have still Charged. asked for some. It would have yeah. been legit to do that, um, but he didn't. And yeah, he wanted to come and have fun. And no one, no one asked. There was some talk amongst some YouTubers. I, I heard that from one of my helpers who was driving them to the hotel. And so he overheard the following conversation between um, another YouTuber who thought, but he didn't know, but he thought that he bet that some of the bigger channels uh, got paid some money to come, which again, would be a legit thing to do because that's how we make money, okay? Yeah. And, um, uh, that YouTuber, uh, said that to Glenn Fricker. It was just an, you know, conversation. And um, and then he said to Glenn, well, you know, you have over 200,000 subs. Uh, um, you know, he would understand that if, if Glenn had asked for some money, that that would be totally okay and and reasonable for Glenn to do. And here's Glenn, looks him in the eye, says, Henning's my buddy. He asked me to come, so I came, period. <laughs> that made me, and I heard that from you know from the driver. That just what what a, what a great guy. It wasn't unreasonable for the other guy to ask that. Absolutely, but um, that just meant the world to me. That just it, it, there wasn't a question in Glenn's mind whether he does that or not, and whether he gets paid for it or not. He just wanted to come and hang out with his right. buddy. That Glenn is a is a really great guy. Um, and they all are all of them. It was just uh a great bunch of people and i really feel that that there's friends now not colleagues but actual friends mm -hmm. um and i'm talking about the kind of friend where you've got something on your mind something's bothering you it doesn't have to be guitar related or whatever just you know you have you have a bad day and you call them up because that's what we do now like that's cool Glenn Fricker calls me like once a week and wants to chat and we just, you know, and Robert Baker. And uh, I, I know if, you know, my girlfriend kicks me again, uh, I can call Phil McKnight and say, Phil, you know, and he'll come <laughs> <stop it>. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You made friends. Now, before GitCon, did you ever feel like some of these guys were competitors? Some of these other YouTubers making... Uh, reviews and demos and those types of things did it ever feel like a competition at some point fucking, fucking pete thorne that <laughs> <laughs> it's like 
with his middies and squiddlies, and then he does the bendies, and then just and he looks cool with his hair and all that stuff, and then and then it sounds good, and then he gets the clicks in the <laughs> I hate that it turned out that he's just like also a really nice guy. That's <laughs> really not possible to hate him for it. That's it's hysterical. Just good. I I love the fact that, and he knows. I will tell him this straight in his face. I know. I I, I love the fact that he doesn't know how to film on the level that you know some of some other people do. Because that's like one of the few things I've got going for myself. I. I, I put money into cameras, so I have loads of cameras. <laughs> one camera, um, but it, it doesn't matter with him. I mean, he's just yeah. Really... I mean, I, I don't think that, that that brings up the point. Does it matter? Yes, it does. Shut up. Of course, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, your thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of cameras, and I just yeah, said he... that. <laughs> <laughs> He's got that like eight hundred dollar camera, and he just puts it in different positions, and it's all it's all good. Um, well, no, it, it, Pete's amazing, and I I, uh, I I I love his videos. He's knowledgeable. He gets amazing sounds. Um, uh, it, it's all positive, but the review part of his reviews is very simple. He simply doesn't review it if he doesn't like it. So if he doesn't do a pedal, well, you know, it's not his thing. So that's a review in itself. If you simply know that he will only review stuff that he's into, then that's an opinion in itself. Hmm. I've, see, I've, I didn't, I've, see, I didn't know I've that. Seen, I've seen that happen. I won't say what, but I've seen it happen. Yeah, it, it makes sense. If you don't want to be negative, that's okay. As long as people know that whatever you review is something you like and you simply refuse to do stuff that you don't like. So yeah, it's all positive. But that means that it's still his opinion. And I think that's good. Um, and uh, it, the only thing with him, and th that comes back to the cameras, is uh, that bugs me a tiny bit is when he's playing, um, he only uses one camera. And I'm thinking, dude, come on. Just, just get a second camera and put it on top of the pedal so that you have that picture-in-picture -picture pedal when he's, you know, he's playing, tweaking. Um, because you always see the pedal right next to him on the table, and you don't see any settings or whatever. So it's he, he's a little well, bit limited by that. You're assuming that he cares. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't, and the fans don't. But I want to pick on something. Because <laughs> it's too perfect. That's fine. Yeah. And then That's it fun. gets when he plays that solo, and it's just like, what if fuck it? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. You know what that reminds me of, Dave? Um, when we were in Nam and uh um it was your buddy Kenny. Yeah. Um we were in Nam and that guy Andres Erd was ripping. He was totally ripping and everybody was just like in awe. We're all like, Oh, this guy's yeah, yeah. playing amazing. And uh your buddy Kenny went had walked up to uh walked up to him, held his hand out. And goes, nice to meet you. Go fuck yourself. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and he broke up laughing. Yeah, yeah, it was hysterical. Everybody was just cracking that was up. Good. Yeah. That was the, um, but but to go back to the question, do I see the channels as competition? In a way, yes. We are. We are. Are we competing for viewers? I don't know. Because Pete's got his thing, which is just being good. I have penis jokes, okay? He doesn't have that. So um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm way ahead of him on that. Um, we all have our thing and our audience that likes certain things. If people see my demo of the BE Overdrive, they'll get something out of it, and then they watch Pete's, and then they watch someone else's, and then you take, you know... Mm -hmm. All three, and then you have the information you need. And so, then there's Sean Tubbs. Yeah. Now, now he yeah, just that's, needs. That's another now, guy. Now he, we just need to break his hands. Yes, absolutely. We just need to break his hands. Yep. What a player. And then he also, he also looks like a nice guy. Why can't they just be assholes? It would be so much. Fun. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sean and I, we need, at, at, at NAM, we need to talk. Sean's awesome. Really, really nice guy. I haven't met him in person, but just. Yeah, he's coming. He's coming to NAM. so. Um, oh, good. He'll be there. So, Sean, um, Sean, Sean is an amazing guitar player. If you haven't watched his, uh, if you don't subscribe to his channel also, other, along with Pete's and Henning's, you should. Yeah. Because uh, it's a whole he, different style. It's a whole different thing. It's, it's like I all, am, all three of you have a different thing. Mm -hmm. He does these double bends, these country thing that I, I, I need to like have some time with him where he shows me how to do that, and then I do it really badly. Um, I had invited him to get come, but he couldn't do it because uh, he had some Carrie Underwood stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. No, he's, he's another another great... He's got a great channel. Does great reviews. He's still building. He's building his channel. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, now, now, now I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be brutally honest about the competition thing. We out of our. If the channels are bigger, we have our, our audiences. People like the Tone King for certain things, and me for certain things, and then we have you know, some of the people are the same. Some people can't handle me at all, and they'd rather watch Phil McKnight. That's the other ball guy. It's all good. Um, for me, I wanted GitCon. It's, it's really ridiculous what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Because <laughs> apparently I have no filter. None. <laughs> so uh, I want to GitCon to establish relationships between the companies and the YouTubers. So that the YouTubers would, that, so that it would be easier for all of us to work with companies get the gear, get paid for it. That was my goal. And that goal has worked to a certain extent because I'm hearing that, you know, the Tone King's talking to Framers and that, you know, Phil McKnight's talking to this company. So it's, it's worked to a small extent. But somehow that's bugging me, which is freaking ridiculous because that was the whole point. <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's bugging me that I made this event and these relationships that I had built with the companies, now the other guys have. Now I've shared my relationship with those companies and got them jobs, which was the whole idea of GitCon. But in hindsight, now that's bugging me. Isn't that wrong? <laughs> What's wrong? Well, well you're, you asked for it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 You I should nice. just shut my mouth and not not do it. But now it's too late. I opened I, I opened Pandora's box. Yeah, cat's out of the bag. So, um, hey, look, you know, I, I think w one of the things that I've seen since starting this show with Dave is when we have other manufacturers on this show. It seems like everybody is really cool with each other. It's a, a really great community of people. Um, it doesn't seem like there, even though we've had Morgan on, we've had Bruce Agnator on, we've had, you know, X, X, Y, and Z people, everybody gets along and, you know, share information and everything like that. So I, I think. Wait a second. Good. The people you just mentioned all work in the same building. That's not fair. Well, that's true. Morgan no. Agnator. Well, not exactly. Well, but you know what I'm talking but, we're, but when we're talking about Michael Saldana, we're talking about Stephen Fryette. I mean, I can go down the list of Obviously, Jordan Metropolis, the, you know, yeah. and all, all these different people who are still, you know, friends and share information. And so getting back to your point of, you know, oh, it kind of bothers me. Yeah, I mean, I could see that. But on the other hand, though, you know, you're sharing to the community, which is a good thing. Yeah. It's just, I don't, I don't know what what's wrong with me because i mean that was exact i achieved what i wanted to achieve it's totally stupid <laughs> <laughs> but hey. i am the thing is i am i think a competitive person mm -hmm. and i really hate that that's i don't play any sports because i hate when that comes out of me i absolutely hate that um i don't uh I don't want to be in competition with these YouTubers. I want to do stuff together. I want to do what our format to be successful. And we can only do that when we work together. You know, it, it can't be, we can't do this in isolation. Um, That's interesting. Then yeah. uh, uh, tell you something else. Uh, is someone who is literally, I'm, I'm going to read this to you because this shows you how great some of these people are. 
Um, I got this today. Hello, friend. We need to schedule our first Skype session soon. I hope you're fantastic. And if you aren't, then don't you think you should be? <laughs> <laughs> it, that, that's just that's just how he writes. And um, I miss your pretty face. He writes that at the end. Um, and he tells me about this pedal that he designed. I don't know if he's building it. I don't know about it. But um, he's asking me how much I would charge him to review his pedal. This is a fellow YouTuber with uh, Croc Boots. Um, so, so Gearman Dude writes me and says, I have a pedal and I want to pay you to review it. I'm not taking money from Gearman Dude. Mm. I mean, I'm flattered that he wants another YouTuber to review his pedal. So, no, keep your money, send me the stupid fuzz, let me make fun of fuzzes, and review it. Well, that, that's I mean, super nice of you. No, I, I would, I would never take money from from a, a colleague. I mean, that is stupid. But right. um, um, no, we've uh, he's been so amazing from the very beginning, and he, we we skyped, and 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 he's been supportive, and he tried to help and go to manufacturers and help as well. Um, it's it's nice to have made these friends. I can imagine. I, I'm a super competitive person. I don't. That's just. I don't know. I, and I, I agree with you. Sometimes it's, it's not a good thing. Um, Dave, are you, are you like that? Are you a competitive person or, or are you kind of laid back on that? No, I'm laid back most of the time, but occasionally <laughs> that, that's why that Peter, Peter said from MP, he goes, you're, you're always so laid back, but I was pissed off about something the other day when he was around and, <laughs> and he goes, it's good to see you pissed off. <laughs> I'm like going, yeah, it's probably not good though. If you see me pissed off, that means someone pushed it too far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but Peter probably said it in the most calm, relaxing voice ever. Oh yeah. Me meanwhile, Peter, Peter is like the calmest person ever. It's just like this warm. Every time I talk to him, it's just this warm cup of tea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I was I was so flattered. I I called him up after I filmed the review that went online today of his uh, Amp One, which is I called it the master beast. Because that is one hell of an app. Um, and I called him up, said, dude, it's just wow. Uh, and and he was, I mean, who am I, literally, in the world? Who am I? Why, why should anything I say matter to anyone? And he was absolutely happy that I liked it. And he, he, li he liked my feedback. He liked my opinion. And to me, that Peter Arendt cared what I thought. That was a, a, a huge honor to me. Mm -hmm. um, really, really amazing amp. Uh, that's that's sad that it has to go back. What amp is that? Uh, the amp one. Can and I'm gonna do the amp it's two. It's the little well. one, right? Short show us. Uh, the little one is um, top left. That's the amp two. Top left. Can't really see it. You can't really see it. Really. Wait. Wait. No. Uh, Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's that's M2. Yeah. Which is a weird kind of concept. Um it has four knobs. Knob number one is called called volume. So it's volt and then volume together. And it does something about stuff. It's I don't like know. It's like it's like a power scaling sort of knob. Yeah, that thing. Um then it has a bone switch with positions one, two, three. And they change how the amp reacts in general and also the bass response. And then it's got tone and gain and a boost switch, and that's it. And the whole idea of that amp is um, that it's, I think, a 20-watt amp. Yeah. And, so yeah. and most of the, the sound is coming out of the power amp. Mm -hmm. So there's no, no effect loop or anything. It's most of the sound is actually generated by pushing the power amp. That's why it's, it's got the, you can actually you know, turn it down. It's a weird concept. But it rocks. It's hmm. a little rock beast. But the big one there, the, the amp one, clocks in at 3,500 bucks. So it's definitely up there. Um, it's a 100 watt monster with two channels, but there is so much you can do with those two channels because it's got a, build, a dual boost built in. Uh, watch the video. It's a crazy good amp. Again, hmm. you'll, you'll pay the money. Um, and um, I'm saying in the video, 
Well, it's in the price range of a BE. What the BE can't do, the AMP1 can't do. It, it, it loop out everything else, but they're, they're not in each other's way in any way. Um, it's, it's just a very impressive AMP, but it takes you some time to, re, to understand how it works and, yeah. and what you have to do to get to the sounds. The, and Peter said, yeah, he thought that the concept was simpler, but he agrees it's, it's not an AMP where you go in the store and you immediately get out of it what you, what you expect. It's, you have to understand how it works. Hmm. Have to check out the video. Check out the video. Yeah, it's uh, it's very cool. Um, very someone cool. asked cool. about like about an hour ago about my guitar, so I'll I'll show you my guitar. Sure, sure. I'm getting echo now. What guitar I have? This is prototype five of my guitar. Um. Oh, that's the Harley Benton. That's the Harley Benton. That's the Harley Benton. And I just, uh, well, didn't I, I think in the, in the Bucks and Boost video, I think I played that. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, it, it's a phenomenally good guitar for 350 bucks. Can it, you know, like stand on its own next to like a boutique guitar for thousands? No, probably not. Um, it is, it's not a fat sounding guitar. It's very mid focused. Um, especially on the humbucker but it, that's why it is really brilliant for lead stuff it's just it it it's beautifully singing mm. and um it's got the p90 in the humbucker three position switch but you can switch the humbucker to single coil and out of face which means in the middle position combined with the p90 there's a lot of different sounds that you can get um that is nice for a nice for a well priced guitar. Well -priced guitar. Yeah. yeah, I mean the, the the idea was let's show that that's possible, but it wasn't as possible as we thought, because factory number one in Vietnam tried and tried, and then we we're like, okay, good prototype number three, let's do it, and then they sent them all, and they all had to go back because they were way too heavy. The pickup cutter was wrong, and they had faults. So they all went back hmm. and then a whole new ship. And then they, then we, they made prototype number four, slightly more shaping here, more shaping here, which lightened it. And we're like, okay, good. We're good. Go and build them. And they built all of them, shipped them to Toman. And they, uh, they all came with the problems here on the nut and glue residue on the necks, and we're like, yeah, that's not working. So make new necks. Bodies were fine. So they made new necks for all of them. Then the next came, but they didn't fit perfectly into the pocket. Oh, man. Which meant that they would have had to do this by hand at Toman for every guitar. And it doesn't make sense because someone had to spend an hour or two doing this at Toman. So because the necks are uh, I always want to say mother of pearl, but that's wrong. A purple heart. It's a purple heart neck and fretboard, um, which was apparently hard to come by. So <laughs> we took them all apart, took the new necks, took all the hardware, sent it to a different company this time in China, one that actually makes really high-end guitars, um, and so we know that they know what they're doing and said, now you have the next from company A. Please build us complete. I don't know why, but please build us completely new bodies for those next. <laughs> um, so here we have prototype number five. And technically, this is the guitar that's now on the way from China. Uh, you hope. I, 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 we hope. We hope that they're all OK. And all of this for 42 instruments, because that's the run we're doing, 42 of them. Wow. I have daily comments and questions. When is it coming out? When is it coming out? We could sell hundreds of these. I know so many people are saying, I'm going to buy this immediately. We'll have 42. They're going to be gone within three minutes. And they're going to be 400 bucks, you said? Uh, 349. Including a gig bag, three of my CDs, which I know I would have to actually pay you to listen to, but still, <laughs> they'll be in there. Um, 
a brand new pack of NYXL strings, which are 15 bucks by themselves. And um, so this guitar has a it's, a, it's a veneer on top of a maple uh, cap, but it's a decent veneer, so it looks nice. Um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy logo. It's got my late dog's paw on the back, so that's Congo's paw. Um, these are no-name tuners probably, but they're locking, and they're actually really good. Uh, I've had much, much worse on much higher price guitars. Um, there's a decent, like, you know, shape here, mm -hmm. shape here, don't know what for. I never understand why that shape is here. Dave, do you know that? Does that, what, that doesn't what make it? a lot of sense, does it? Zero. Because for that to make sense, You'd have I would to have bend to your hand like, like yeah. Who plays guitar like this? I don't know. When I'm going into the highest, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. I think this is really to bullshit people. They're going to go, oh, yeah, I can play higher. Because they don't think about how they <laughs> This is completely pointless. That should be on the front. If, if I go up here to, to make use of this, I'm going to have to play like... It yeah. makes no sense. Um, this is a very, very solid guitar for the money. I wanted everything reduced. No, not a lot of inlays because that costs money. Fixed bridge because on a cheap guitar, who wants a bad tremolo? Any, and a, 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 tremolo costs money. Floyd costs money. Tremolo costs money. Uh, carving, uh, carving it out costs money. Installing it, setting it up. No, I wanted it very simple so that what's actually on here is of the highest quality in that price range. And I think they managed to do this. I um, I just used it on the, uh, the Holes lead guitar on the Dirty Shirley module, the uh, Synergy. And I don't think that's in any way a bad sound. No, kind of, that got a really good sound. So um, it, this is a great instrument for, especially for leads. You have a very bluesy, nice uh, P90 thing, and you go in the back and you have re this really mid-focus screaming lead. And if you really want that Brian May thing, you go middle position, single call, out of phase, roll back the tone a bit, and then you're right there in that mm -hmm. queenish, mm -hmm. that thing. Cool. Now, what was the, um, is there any story behind the color scheme? Uh, that's my logo colors, or supposed to be. My logo colors are turquoise and, and purple. Gotcha. And it turned out a little bit more green than turquoise. Actually, in the camera right there on the screen that I'm looking at, it looks pretty much dead on. But that's it's it's incredibly tough to nail those colors when you're staining a top and making pickups. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so this is going to be the limited edition run, but people like the concept. There isn't a lot of this going on, and especially not in a lower price range. And not. I agree. I agree. You won't you won't find guitars with have coil splitting and out of phase at that price range. And um, plus, what's very important to me. These are not push pull. These are push push. Yeah. Which no one does. I don't I don't understand why no one does that. Hmm. I have a six thousand dollar modern Eagle PRS. And if I play this thing live, I have to get under the pot with my fingernail to pull it up. Yeah. What PRS doesn't have the money for a push push? So everyone tells me. A, which is completely wrong, while on a push-push, you can't see whether it's engaged or not. Oh, come on. <laughs> tells me, Brian from PRS, nicest guy, also was under the impression that you don't see the state of the knob. Well, here, you clearly see that it's coming up. How is that any different from the push-pull? There's, there's no there's difference. Not. And, then you, and you would know the difference by the sound also. You could hear it. Yeah, but I mean, you you want to look at it and see. I understand the visual feedback, mm -hmm. but the only difference here is you don't have to grab it and pull it. It's actually like a switch. The difference is these are these probably break easier than the other ones. Mm -hmm. But you know what? If they do, just install a new one. It's fifteen bucks. They do break easier, and also some people make the mistakes. If 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 your guitar has a push-on knob on a push-push pot. 
Yes. They'll make they'll make the mistake of trying to take the knob off if they need to take the knob off while it's uh, down, and then that breaks the whole thing. You have to do it while it's in the out position. Oh yeah, of course. Otherwise, you're, you're yeah. pulling yeah. it up. Yeah. Just break the whole thing. Mm. Which now that you're saying that, I see this. These are not screw on. These are push on. Yep. Because that tiny little screw probably costs half a cent too much. <laughs> Or they don't actually make the pot in a push push and it with a with a uh, solid shaft. He said solid shaft. <laughs> I did. I'm sorry. I, didn't know this. Oh, I love it. I, I just love it. That's so funny. But for me, if I get a guitar built, I always insist on push push because I can play and just go like this. Yeah. You can't switch it that fast. And the awesome thing is, I showed that to Brian from PRS, and he said. I just ordered some push push for my guitars. I, I don't get this. Why don't high end guitars have this? And if they're really afraid that they break, put a spare one in the case. Right. I'm dropping five grand on a guitar. I think they can put a spare one in the case. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Interesting. I don't disagree. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, if we can do it on a 350 euro guitar, I think that high end guitar makers can afford it. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I think you're right. And, oh, and we're going to have a, a series model uh, where it's probably going to be light gray, black pickups, that's more compatible with most people's taste, mm. and probably very subtle inlays uh, between the E and A string because people said no fretboard inlays bugs mm. them which for me, I don't look on the fretboard when I play, I look on the side dots. Yeah, yeah, I, you know what, I'd have to, I've never played a guitar without fret inlays, so I'm, I'm not sure how I would react to that, I have to see. I have several, and I, for me, it's not a problem at all. I look on the, on the sides. I think 99% of the people look on the sides because yeah. you don't play like this. That's true. They think they need it, but I don't think they do. The only issue is when you're teaching, um, without anything in the fretboard, that's problematic. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. you're looking right at it. Yep, it yeah. makes sense. Uh, Purple Rocket 666 had a, a comment, more than 30 minutes without a bad penis joke. Thumbs up, Henning. But you just did it. <laughs> I'm sorry, his name is Purple Rocket. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, how are you doing on time, Henning? Because we're we're running on two hours and 30, 30 minutes. I'm, I'm good. Whatever. I'm 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 having a second wind. Okay. Cool. So yeah, I'm gonna. I thought you were gonna be falling asleep. <laughs> I will crash badly when we're done with this. But um, hey, when when do I have a chance to hang out with you guys? So uh, I'm. <laughs> That's true. I'm good. Ma'am. <laughs> so Randall Fisher says Friedman has to be there. So I assume he means get con. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. go. Yeah, but he doesn't know anything. No, <laughs> Randall doesn't. He has no idea. No idea. Of course, I want Dave to be there. I wanted Dave to be there this year. We have um, another interesting comment. Ice Coffee Tone says, "Please don't turn GitCon into an infomercial." Oh hell no! You know, it, it is about. Here's the thing. It's about the YouTubers. It always will be. The companies have to be glad that they can be there. Gitcon is very simple. If you throw all of us together, but there are no guitars and no amps, well, then that's not an event, right? Nope. So I have to have gear there. Otherwise, all these gear channels don't have anything to do. And that's it. I have to have some gear and hopefully interesting gear, gear that allows us to do interesting videos. Yeah. Um, I wanted some, a lot of stuff that I imagined in terms of content didn't happen. For example, I wanted some really cool high-end luthiers there. So I, like Nick Huber, um, well, PRS brought a private stock, that was good. I wanted us to do something that we can never do. When do you have a chance to grab four guitars worth eight grand? And drag them in a room and compare. Not say one is better, but just let's play four incredibly expensive guitars. You can never do that. Mm -hmm. I wanted 
us to be able to do stuff like this. Take a master build framers and a PRS private stock and a Nick Huber and a Hartung or whatever, and just do a shootout. Where, where can you do that? For example, where would you be able to have an impede switcher other than at NAM with two or three treatments on there and just see, you know, do they just change the size and the color or do they actually sound different? Mm -hmm. You know, so stuff like this. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to have the gear there for that. So it's never going to be an infomercial. Um, I'm, as long as I'm involved, I will organize it as someone like someone who's coming from the point of view of Phil McKnight and the Tone King and Pete Thorne. I will organize it as someone who does not want to be told what to do as someone who does not want to be censored or told, Oh, you can't say this. If you come as a company, you can't tell me what to say. If I want to drag your product in the room and bitch about where you placed the input jack, I'll do that. Whether or not after that you want to work with me, that's up to you. But you can't put rules on us. Mm -hmm. It's a different world now. It's not the magazine world where you buy an ad and everything is great in the review. It's we're independent. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you realize, Mark, that, uh, you know, now that um, we are YouTubers, as someone pointed out here, mm -hmm. that uh, yeah. I'm afraid you're going to have to go to Germany next year. I would love to go to Germany next year. If Henning will have me, I I hope I can go. We'll do the Tone Talk show from GitCon. GitCon. Well, and here's the thing. This should be great. Yeah. And you are actually not using up any of the, uh, technically, you guys don't need one of the rooms with all the torpedoes and the amps and stuff right. like this. Because what you do is we can get you guys a couch in the showroom somewhere and you can drag a different guy on there all day as long as you have your one or two cameras that you need to do it yourself mm -hmm. um you could you know go home with half a year's worth of shows interesting because you do yeah. this right here what we're doing yeah. you do with what technically with one camera and a couch yep right yeah so right, you wouldn't if, if i know for example that i have a, a youtuber that does stuff like this and I don't need space and time in, in the main rooms, then I can book that guy on top of everyone else because I know it's not going to be any problems in terms of, you know, taking time away from other people. Exactly. The show, the show should be done on, on those, uh, those, those high, uh, bar stools in the, wherever that was. I saw that Pete was sitting there talking, there's high tables and bar stools and, sitting there talking to a couple people. Hmm. Uh, we'll actually have a, um, an interview area. We're going to uh, curtain off the stage and create a little kind of living room situation back there. Oh, that'd be good. So where people can just do um, interview there. But we have a lot of other areas that we can set up with just a um, you know, little couch area, whatever. To do what we're doing right now, it's, that's not, not a problem at all. You could... Yeah. I mean, you could do an interview with every single YouTuber. You could do interviews with manufacturers. We're going to have artists from uh, manufacturers. So, yeah. 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 And, uh, I don't think, I don't see a, see a problem in that. No, that'd be great. That would be awesome. That would be fantastic. Well, and of uh, course, we'll, we wouldn't we'll have Dave to drag into any videos because Dave's going to be busy making his own videos. <laughs> that's but that's also something we want to encourage more. Uh, Derek from Rev, uh, he also works for, for Two Notes. He was clever. I think he just used his phone. And he went around and got some testimonials from guys. So he created his own social media content. Yeah. We need to encourage companies to say, look, bring a camera, point them at people, create content for your Facebook, create your own content. Um, what some companies realized and again, learning process. The gear you bring is almost irrelevant. It's who you bring as a person. Mm -hmm. You know, how are you socializing? How are you hanging out? Mm -hmm. The companies that treated it like a trade show, sitting behind their desk 
with the guitars on it. We weren't running around like at NAMM. We're not coming over to you. Hey, what, what do you have in store for us today? No, no it was about hanging out. And the companies that got that got more coverage out of it than the companies that waited for us to, to walk over. Mm. Yeah, and, it makes um, sense. And my buddy from Vox, he was there for two days. The two days that he was there, people were, were using Vox amps. They were hanging out with him, checking out the stuff he had there. As soon as he left, because he didn't have the full week, no one cared about Vox anymore. It's about the people. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, it, and it should be about the people. And I think that's something that, Dave, you do really well. Let's say 15 years ago, people would have known your product and they would have known the store. Meaning I go to Toman or Musique Produtif and I know the store where I'm buying it and I see the amp. Right. And that's what I'm evaluating. The people at the store and how they're treating me, you know, and the amp and the name on the amp. But I wouldn't have known who makes it. There was no transparency about the people behind the product. Yeah. Nowadays, that has a huge oh, bearing on what everything. I buy. Yep. Who am I buying from? Is that a cool guy? Because um, I know my money goes to support him and his family, and whatever, and the other pe the people making it. And I want to know that I'm buying from cool people. And uh, uh, Robert Keeley had a great experience there because people really appreciated him being there and him as a person. And people wrote to me saying, Keeley wasn't on my radar, but now that I saw him and how cool he is at GitCon, I looked at the pedals and I put a whole bunch on my wish list because I'd rather buy from him than someone else. Mm -hmm. So people <clears throat> matter it, now more than ever, I think. Yeah, it's important to get to know, I think, manufacturers now or people who are buying the products. I mean, they, you put a face to a, a brand and it, it adds it adds more of a human element to it than just this mystique of the name, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think, Dave? You know, I, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of... Um, it's like when... Um, this has got, kind of gone on for years. It's like it's like when you when you got together and you, you you meet people for the first time and let's say you're taking them to dinner or something and it's like hey let's go to dinner you know and and you have some drinks with them and 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 you know they have a great time and you pay for the whole bill <laughs> and everything you know but people walk away from that going wow that was great he did that I didn't have to do that you know that was awesome it just it's sort of like you know that. It still happens, you know. It's it's like um, uh, people <laughs> will like you more because of they learn who you are and and they like you. So as long as you have a product to back that up, you know, it it, yeah, exactly. it, it helps. You know, I think someone who's 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 done very well of presenting himself and therefore also the company is a Jeff Kiesel, for example, yeah. because he. He's the face of the company and he's clever. He goes to the shop and takes an instrument. It's like, oh, that's awesome. Click, iPhone, Facebook, bam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, you see his arms, you know, it's the tats. It's him, it's Jeff. Yeah. It's the yep. himself running around. And that hands on, oh, look, pride in the instrument. Look, look what we got, click, you know? Um, that, that's great that direct connection of him, the instrument, him, the audience, um, full transparency. And companies that get this social media aspect and also this, uh, you know, I can't hide. Um, uh, I have to tell people that I'm the guy behind this. Um, I think that really works. Robert Keely was a little bit afraid uh, to, to be that guy, but it fully worked out for him. Brian Wampler is another great example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm 100% convinced that probably 85% of Wampler buyers buy it because of Brian. He's yeah. He's yeah, sure. Brian's they're great, great people, but mm -hmm. he's a goofball. He's, he's not afraid to be nerdy. Mm -hmm. um, he's Fun. just one of us. He's one of us. Yeah, yeah. And he makes great products. I mean, you know, you yeah. gotta, at the end of the day, you've got to make a great product. 
right? Because if you know, yeah, you have to back that up, of course. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think that's probably where I'm going to name two random companies, Marshall and Gibson, um, are, are totally failing because those are corporations. Vox the same way. That's you know the Japanese boss probably also. There's no Mr. Boss. There's no Mr. Marshall anymore. You don't have the the guy. You have a logo, and behind the logo is a whole machinery of a company that now is trying to sell you headphones. Um, so I, I think that a lot of guitar players don't don't like that they don't know where that's that's going. I think it, as long as Jim Marshall was still around, you knew okay. I'm buying this guy's amp, but that's not whose amp am I buying now? So shareholders. Yeah. Um, and Marshall is heavily trying to convince people now to buy their modeling amp and their headphones and their Bluetooth amps. Um, at the trade show where it just was, all the products that they showed were the Marshall code. They didn't have any tube amps. Zero. None. Wow. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just like, why? Not that it's a bad product. I, d I don't, it's good. It's a beginner amp and it's modeling and it's all cool. It's all fine. But, but, but don't show us only that. That makes no sense. Um, Fender, Fender is trying to sell us $300 Bluetooth speakers that look like a little Fender amp. Why? All they're doing is, and it, it, it's possibly clever, they have brand recognition, they have mojo, they have history. So slap that logo on something halfway related, it also makes a sound, and sell it to people that want Fender on their Bluetooth speaker. What's that guy talking about? Is <laughs> <laughs> it going on and on in German? Oh. You can hear now. Who, who, okay. who, who was that? What do you think? I, I can't, can't I can't, see. wait, I can't, can I click on this? Can I? Can you oh, see him? That guy, what, uh, I just yeah. bitched about you. He was just, he was just <laughs> saying some horrible things about you. <laughs> really horrible things about you. Really? I wanted to break your hands and stuff. Oh, uh, hi, honey. <laughs> cool. they, asked me, they asked me if I think, if I see other YouTubers as, as competition, I said, absolutely not, except this freaking that that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you do with, not. You know, with, with the hair and the middlies and the squiddlies and the bendies. It's just it's not, it's not right what you do. Whatever. Not, Look at all those amps you got behind you. I know, right? Yeah, but I don't know how to set them up. You do. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's got Dave for that. Put everything on Anyone 10. can buy amps. That's easy. <laughs> Give me a break. Good to see you. Uh, same here, my friend. Miss you guys, all you folks over there. We had fun in Germany. We had tons of fun. I am. Uh, I have to admit, it took me, I think, a week to watch your Marshall on Ten video. Oh yeah, because it destroyed me that I couldn't be in it. Ah, uh, you should have been. <laughs> in it. I know you were running around. You were looking for me. I was helping someone with something again, and watching that really hurt. I have uh. to admit. I know it, you. You were looking for me. I know you tried. But I did. Yeah. I still wanted to be part of that experience. Yeah, I'm sorry we didn't. Uh, that video yeah. was made on the last day, I think, or or one of the last days. I think it was on Thursday, and we did it at night like from five till six i just grabbed as many guitar players as i could that had time to come down there but it, looked like, it looked like you were all having a blast and a, i felt like the kid in the corner that's left yeah. out you know yeah. because, uh, i'm sorry well, i'm you had so much to do well, we'll do it busy. again you were running around yeah. like yeah we'll do it again do it we'll do it yeah, but, then, but then we have to like you know put a friedman up on all thing and is that gonna work do these amps even sound good have you played one of the Friedman amps? <laughs> are, are they any good? Always taking the piss. <laughs> I'll see you later. Are, are you picking up a pedal board? Am I picking up a pedal board? No, 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 no. No, but my, my board is over here on Dave's bench getting uh, getting built. 
It's, it's gonna I be see cool. with the, with the special custom riser for the H nines. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it saves so much space. I'm I'm stalking you. See, see, I'm I'm up to speed on things. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm making a video on the pedal board build. Actually, it'll turn out to be three videos, I think. And, you know, That's cool. As it's progressing, and then once it's done, I'll make like a musical one. You know, actually using it. Very cool. Yeah, I, I don't I don't want to see that. That's just that's just <laughs> just too depressing. <laughs> Come on. I'm <laughs> Good to see you, man. Hey, have yeah, a good one, Pete. Bye. Cool. Um, all right, let's uh, let's jump into chat for a little bit more. You okay, for time? Yeah. Uh, all good. All right, let's let's go for a little bit longer. Um, Donnie Lovett says, "Hey, Dave, got my books and boost pedal last week." Made my shitty amp sound great. Love it. Thanks. Shout out Perfect. to Henning. <laughs> <laughs> I describe the pedal as whatever your amp sounds like, just more of it. So if the amp is shitty, doesn't don't you have just more shit then? Uh, you might be able to shape it to be not as shitty. Ah, uh, that's yeah. But you also yeah. said it's very yeah. shapeable boost. Mm -hmm. yes. Or in French, chapable. That's what you said. Chapable. <laughs> <laughs> now Henning, did you? Yes. I didn't see it in the video, and I don't think I've seen anybody's video do this, where they put it in the loop as a actual volume boost. I didn't do that because I don't do that, which is uh, I should do that because that would be informative. Um, but two two reasons: a, I don't use it like this because I don't play live anymore, so I don't need a volume boost. And question, would that, what would be the information you need that I tell you that it works or that it actually jumps up in volume? Because it's a YouTube video. It's I true. Just, no, that's a great I mean, point. That's a great point. Just get louder, yeah. technically. So all that you would need is for me to tell you it works. Right. Because otherwise, all, all that you would get in the video, it'll get louder, pushing the torpedo more than distorting. So technically, I should test something like this ahead of time, and in the video, just include the information that it works as a volume boost in the loop, right? It does. So there you go. We solved the problem. Yeah, I would. Agree, go. I would agree with that. Yeah, because I actually was thinking about that. How would you represent that from a video perspective? Yeah. And it's you. Know, you just have to warn people. Hey, by the way, lower your volume because it's about to get louder. <laughs> you know, um, I don't even know if that would work that way, but. Uh, yeah, it, wouldn't because then the, all the rest of the video would have to be lowered. And of course, yeah. I'm, I'm compressing my, my voice and stuff to be as loud as possible so that they can listen to it on their iPhone on the crapper. <laughs> exactly. Um, we have Ag Agia Rosa says, keep GitCon small for now and Warwick um, so the culture that made it so unique becomes well established. Interesting. Um, Ice Coffee Tone says, GitCon needs strippers. <laughs> In the bar, in the bar, in the bar area, I think that might be a good good idea. It's not a bad well, suggestion. Well, if we let Dave come, it could be his job to arrange that and also bring the coke. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that there could be the Dave. You can come if. <laughs> see, see. I will. Uh, I will delegate that to you. I don't think Dave wants those responsibilities. <laughs> Maybe part of those responsibilities, but I mean, not the second half. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, make GitCon like Survivor Germany, someone says. Interesting. Uh, let's, okay. Um, I'm going to keep scrolling we'll, down. We'll vote a YouTuber off GitCon every day. There, there you yep. go. <laughs> that's not how you build a community that's how you destroy your community <laughs> i'd be the first one voted off gitcon <laughs> <laughs> probably yep uh pablo honey says phil x's face during the fight was worth it all <laughs> it was it was uh, he was just laughing and phil was like he was very scared <laughs> that's funny um Okay, let's see. My favorite at GitCon was when that Jason guy got so mad at me that on the Friday live, 
he said my YouTube name and was mad at me protecting the Tone King. The blues rock guy? I don't know that. Then Phil X says, just play bass. You know what that he's talking about? He, he said, just play bass. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Okay. Um, would Henning consider doing a separate bass con? And invite Glenn Fricker. Yeah. That's a good, good idea. Um, it, the problem is there aren't a lot of bass channels. Like, there are very, very few. Now, I think Gitcon just should grow to the point where it makes sense to include the bass players in the bass channels. Um, I once in a while do bass stuff, but there are some, there are few but good channels that do bass. Um, problem with that is it's not enough to invite the YouTubers. That also means then I have to include bass companies. That means when Ibanez brings 10 instruments, they'll have to bring six guitars and four basses. Mm. Same for everyone else. That means then some companies will have to be bass companies and bass amp companies. And then it becomes a, does it make sense if I only have four bass channels there to then invite companies to, you know, it, mm -hmm. it needs to have a certain size for that to make sense. Yeah. Um, Henning, have you trademarked GitCon? Blondie's Pink Noise wants to know. Not, uh, I think Warwick has. So not for myself, but I think Warwick has. Someone should before they, before you lose it. Uh, I uh, parked the GitCon YouTube channel because I think what we should do is actually have a, some content there and have that as a hub. Actually, not my idea. Sorry, don't want to take credit. That was the other bald guy's idea, Phil McKnight. Um, to have a YouTube GitCon channel where some of the stuff is hosted, like the live streams, but also when, let's say, Tyler Larson has a new video, he can actually put that, put a teaser on the GitCon channel to draw some people to his channel. So the GitCon right. channel could be a, uh, an outlet for a lot of us to have once in a while some extra content to only have on the GitCon channel and to put teasers there that from there you get to all the other channels. I think that's a, it's a yeah, cool idea. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, but of course, I have to build that and, and put some content there first. So I parked it. It's mine, um, but would have to build it. The thing, thing is, I'm incredibly busy because I also have to actually do stuff that pays me. So because um, <laughs> uh, the whole GitCon thing just cost me money and I didn't make any. So that means I, I just have to also, you know, produce videos. And right now, someone sent me... Like a lot of these little things that look like they go in a toaster. I know that <laughs> and, guy. And I don't know what they do. They have little switches and doikis. Um, and there's glowy things inside. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so Henny's technical a, description of, of the synergy module. <laughs> there's little switches and doikis and knoblies and the glowy things. Um, so... Uh, and transistors, if they have transistors. <laughs> so, um, I, I have a lot of these here, and that means on my channel you will see probably a good 13, 14 videos in a row dealing with Synergy. And uh, my next probably two weeks straight will be filming these, making tracks, making videos. Uh, it's a lot of work. And also, I actually have to learn what they do, which is... Uh, they're super the cool. They if, you have if you have questions, ask me. I uh, I most certainly will. And one thing to I know everything to know about every single one of those. Okay, then um, th there's there's definitely some questions that I would have. I mean, I make I want to make the videos on my channel. I'll, I'll make some little ones where it's just playing, and you get those <laughs> for you. But. I, I want to answer some questions that I would have, which means mm -hmm. each of these videos for each module probably has to be quite long because I can put it in the SYN 1 and use the SYN's built-in speaker simulator. I want to know what that sounds like. If I only have a SYN 1 going DI into my audio interface, I want to know what that sounds like. Mm -hmm. Then I want to know what it sounds like if I turn the speaker simulation off going through my own IR, like mm -hmm. a cap or a wall of sound.
So that's number two. I want to know what does it sound like using the 5050 power amp that is also a Synergy product. So that's sound number three. Then I want to know what it sounds like into the power amp of an amp. Mm -hmm. But the question is, which amp am I using? Technically, it should be at least two different amps, like an AC30 and something else. So we're talking about an easy five to six situations that I have to show every module in to answer every question that someone might have. Yeah, yeah. So no, it, yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah, that's, and I have 11 modules. So we're talking about 11 modules tested with probably five to six different wiring setup combos so that everyone gets their question answered. Um, and that's the reason why I have the BE and the Morgan and the Marshall and the Dirty Shirley because they're parked here so they can actually compare these with the original amp. Mm -hmm is also going to be part of the video so no one bitch about these videos being half an hour long this there's just no way of doing it in depth and not cover all of it um but dave while i have you on here okay. let me ask you the uncomfortable question as a reviewer technically it doesn't make sense for you if the dirty shirley module sounds as good as the dirty shirley because then that made the Dirty Shirley kind of obsolete. But the expectation is that the Dirty Shirley module within the Synergy system sounds as good as the Dirty Shirley, because if it doesn't, then it's not a good module. So comment on that. How, how would I present well, that? Well, well, first of all, um the Dirty Shirley module into what power amp of what amp? Mm -hmm. So uh, the Dirty Shirley preamp section will be very much, if not extremely close, to the preamp section of the Dirty Shirley into its same power section. So what you have is, you know, if you're using a, bl uh, a Blues DeVille or something, Fender Blues mm -hmm. DeVille, and you're you're switching in this high-end preamp to the Blues DeVille power section, it sounds considerably different than the Dirty Shirley. Um, so really, it's really a question of what are you going to use it into? And, and so what if I how, use it into the 50-50? Into the 50-50. Can it sound similar? It can sound similar. It's not the same power section. The, uh, in particular, on the Dirty Shirley amp, you have a, 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 a tube rectifier, and you have lower filtering, so it has more sag to it and more f like feel to it. Um, it's a little different. It's still going to be a little different, you know. And the other nice thing is, okay, so you have, uh, you know, the nice thing about the Synergy, uh, especially the Sin One, is you can add you know, some alternate channels or alternate sounds. Say you have a Friedman BE amp, but you kind of want a Soldano sound. Um, you can, although it's not the same power amp, you can get pretty close and give yeah, you that kind of texture and flavor, you know. Um, or, or, or you have a Dirty Shirley amp and you want to add a clean channel to it. Well, yep. you can add uh, the, the Beeman channel or the, the Twin Deluxe that, that Synergy has, and you can add it to it and have two more cleaner kind of sounds to your already dirty Shirley. So it's it's a tool, it's just another tool. I, especially with the dirty Shirley, you can, with the, with the module, I had the, the module into the 50-50, and um, it's a great sound, but I wouldn't say that it can replace the dirty Shirley, because the dirty Shirley, especially that um, it has so much heft in the, in the bottom, it's just, mm -hmm. it's a very powerful sound, which, I couldn't get exactly replicated with the Synergy setup. Same with, with the Dirty Shirley pedal, which I ran into tons of amps. The, the quality of the drive was always there, right. but the frequency response mm. that the Dirty Shirley had was never exactly like that. And again, you'd be, you know, it wouldn't be smart of you to go and have a product for 200 bucks 
with a pedal or a synergy that can replace your twenty seven hundred dollar product. Mm -hmm. um, but but getting close, you would only really know if you had both of them on an ampede switcher and switch back and forth. Mm -hmm. That's when you would really know where the difference is, and it is a minute difference. Now let's uh, let me ask you something else. Um, if we have this one, where is it? It's in, of course it's in here. Ah! <laughs> I have to take it out of the... Ow, ow, ow. That is definitely something I'm gonna bitch about. Be prepared for that. Those thumb screws. Um, so we have the Plexi module here, which I think is very cool because it kind of looks like the input section of a Plexi with a four. Yeah, thing. it's a tied, it's a tied, uh, it's got kind of a bass channel and, uh, and the high treble channel and it. Yeah. You can kind of blend like you would with a jumper cable on an old Plexi. But this particular, if you're looking to get very cleanish Plexi sounds, that's not mm -hmm. what this module does. Okay. Um, this module does more of the cranked up, crunchy to really cranked up plexi sound. Okay. So if you're looking to do really kind of light gain stuff, plexi, real round stuff, this one isn't totally voiced for that. This is more for the rock plexi kind of thing. Okay. Because there's also this, the Metropolis module. Yes. Now that will actually get you a little more vintage round cleaner with strat sort of plexi kind of sound which answers my question because wouldn't those two be competing against each other totally but different that. totally different both totally plexi different. but different kind of plexi yeah if you're looking if you're looking for the plex so the plex regular plexi if you're looking for more of the van halen-esque plexi shall we say you know, cranked up, and, and that's the one for you. If that's you're looking for more of the Jimi Hendrix lower gain uh, uh, kind of plexi, then the Metroplex is the one for you. So if you wanted the ultimate plexi setup, get a SIN 2, put both of them in there, that there gives you, you four channels of different plexi. Well, uh, but then again, the Dirty Shirley module can also be thrown in there because that can get you some variations of plexi, plexi too. And the BE module could get you some variations of plexi also. So, so it's just different flavors. I'm going to have to learn the minute differences of all these marshall -y kind of flavors of these modules and then how to present them and how, how to say, well, if you're looking for this, you need this. I don't know these things. Yeah. I don't know modules. There's probably some overlap on the, on the plexi module versus, say, the BE module, and there's probably some overlap a little bit with the Shirley and the Metropolis. And Now, where's your Line 6, Marshall? Where, uh, your Line 6 module, where I put the module in, it sounds exactly like a nice little spider. Do you have that? You know, it's, it's, it's coming. I, I don't, but on eBay, I think you could buy a spider for really low money. <laughs> a lot of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to really get into this. I think what I'm gonna do is uh, what I just did with the uh, Dirty Shirley module. I'm gonna produce a track for each of the modules, or well, for a lot of them, because that will be a lot of tracks. And while actually making music with it, you get a much better feel than just just plugging it in and you know dialing things. Mm. You, trying to use it in, in a musical context really shows you what it can and cannot do. So I think that's what I'm gonna have to do. So you got all the uh, all the modules? Yeah, I have the SIN 1, SIN 2, the 5050, and all 11 modules. It's uh, it's going to be a very, very time-involving process. <laughs> and that's why uh, Dennis was so nice from Musique Productif, and he sent, um, he sent me the Dirty Shirley, the BE, the Morgan, and the Marshall, and the VH4. Um, so that I could actually compare the original uh, amps to the modules. Um, the only problem is that I don't think he's getting those amps back. I'm gonna have to figure that out with him somehow. 
Wow. How, how can you have a dirty Shirley in your amp rack and play it? And then and let then, it go. And then let it, it's just not, it's not going to happen. I'm sorry. Yeah, because you'd, yeah, you'd have to pry that, that amp from my dead Wait, cold fingers. Then, he, he did. I'm not shitting you. He did send me these amps and the modules, and there was a lot of little boxes. Every single product had a post-it note on it that said, don't lick it. Every <laughs> single one. But here's a very simple way well, to keep it. Well, maybe you should lick it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And now that one, at least, is mine. If you lick it, you keep it. That's how it is, right? Yeah. You can't sell that anymore. It's, that's a health hazard right yeah, there. Yeah, it's tainted. Oh, well, now maybe we can sell it for more. <laughs> maybe, maybe, like, someone would like to buy the, the Henning licked uh, Dirty Shirley amp. They're going to clone me. For what? <laughs> Bad penis jokes? I, why See, would someone... You know, and Mark, and if you if you take this video and you um, and, and you put little uh, 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 time marks or something, mm -hmm. make make sure you just put Henning licking dirty Shirley. <laughs> I will. I will put the timestamp. People um, will be like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> I I still don't quite know how you get away with those names, by the way. Maybe like how, how you, you get away with them. I don't want to say how you get away, but but how you had the balls to go for those names. Because you're in the U.S., and in the U.S., stuff like this is, you know, people are like, whoa, really? You know what I mean. I mean, well, I mean the Dirty Shirley is probably the tamest of all of them, you know. It's just yeah, I know. That's like more of an homage to uh, pinup, kind of pinup culture and stuff. So mm -hmm. uh, same with the Bucks and Petty. That all kind of came from pinup kind of. And even that is already racy for some people. But then you have the PT. Well, people just have to um... loosen up. I mean, it well, is rock and roll. You know, when and people compete, you know what? Here, here, here's what I feel. Uh, you know, people will have long threads. It, it's kind of calmed down over time. But in the past, people would have long threads on different forums and stuff about um, how dumb our names are or how uh, juvenile or, or, or whatever. And you know, just can't you just have some fun? I it's mean, rock and roll. Can't I mean, you just have some fun? It's rock and roll. Is this is this world so PC now that you can't even just have fun with this? I mean, um, and and then I always laugh because it's you know a ten page thread on the names, and I'm like going, thank you. <laughs> exactly. Because you just talked ten pages about Friedman amps, and how many people are going? Ooh, I got to check that out. I got to see what that's about. No, Absolutely. You know, tons of them. No, I, I, I love that. I mean... Yes, I understand. Maybe the worship market maybe doesn't like it very much, but... Um, <laughs> um, that is fine. That is totally it's, okay. It's okay. That might not be the market you're searching. Yep. So, nothing wrong with it. But, no. I mean, if you, if you can't, you know, put a piece of tape over the name. I, actually, generally, the names aren't, like, really displayed. They're not. You know? On the amp, so no, it doesn't say it anywhere. No, nope. BE one hundred says BE one hundred. It doesn't not say anything on the front. Not on the amp. No, not 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 on in the front. back. Yep, and it says BE one hundred. And originally the BE one hundred BE what did it did it stand for Brown Eye? Yeah, yeah. it did. Okay, but well, you didn't but but you didn't intend it to mean what it meant, right? You were thinking not originally, more. not originally. Yeah, it was more really? about kind of. Yeah, actually, it was it was kind of funny. It was an employee of mine said uh, it was like a mod I did, and he goes, "You should call it the Brown Eye." And I'm like, and what in my head at the time, I wasn't even thinking where he went with it. I was thinking, oh, the brown sound kind of thing, okay. And then, and then a while later, it was like, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> <laughs> too late. Oh, that's and hysterical. Then, and then you really went with the HBE. And the PT. Well then, well, then you just had to keep. Then you could keep going, and you had to. And you know the PT, the the, P, the PT. Well, technically, the Pink Taco. Uh, I can't use PT anymore because uh, um, um, it's a uh, PT one hundred. Uh, it's uh, because of, of of John John Sir. <laughs> so it's the Pink Taco. Um. Uh. It you know it's a restaurant. 
It yeah, is. of course. It's a restaurant in, in Las Vegas and in Los Angeles. Uh, there you so, go. You know, sort of, you know, it's a cool it's, little Mexican restaurant. It's good to know that there's companies still just embracing, look, it's rock and roll, it's fun. I mean, come on, most people who play an amp like this are on stage with their shirt open and, you know, little gold chain and the hairy chain. Come on, the whole rock and roll get up and I only wear black and all this, and then you can't have an amp that's a little bit racy? It doesn't make sense. It, it, <laughs> it's all got to fit together. Yep. No, I love it. I think the names that it, it was one of those things that drew me to it. I was kind of like, oh, brown eye. What is this? I got to check, you know. Um, <laughs> you see, there you go. Then it worked. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's give this uh, five more minutes because I got to bolt soon. Um, we had a question, uh, Brian M. Henning. How did you get Phil X to attend GitCon? especially after coming off tour with Bon Jovi? Uh, I asked him. Easy enough. <laughs> I asked him a year and a half earlier at um, in Frankfurt. He was playing like acoustically for Framers, and I walked up to him and said, Phil, and he's like, oh, Henning, you well. And he hugged me and said, Phil, I've got this in this plant. And then he's like putting his thinking cap on. He looks in the... In, in, Here's what I'm saying is like, dude, that's an amazing idea. Of course I'm there. And then he drew a heart on my shoulder and wrote mom in it with a Sharpie. <laughs> um, and that was it. And then once in a while, you know, I reminded him about it. And the only question was, can he do it in terms of, you know, Bon Jovi? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Bon Jovi could have, of course, have canceled the tour because of GitCon. That's, you know, priorities, of course. Um, you would expect that. Yeah, I of course I would expect that. Come to GitCon, play with Bon Jovi, come on. Do the important thing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, then, of course, Hans Peter just, you know, got that happening and said, hey, Phil, you got to come. And I have to say, I am so proud of the guy because I had uh, base camp, you know, Phil shows up at like, you know, one or two. Doesn't have to be there all day. So he, he sleeps in, you know, hey, rock star. And shows up late, and that's totally cool. At GitCon, he was there early in the morning every single day, worked his ass off all day, uh, went up on stage. The guy worked 12, 14 hour days every single day. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't expect that of him, I gotta say that. Not because I think he's a you know lazy fuck, but just I didn't think he would actually just put in that much work. Um, he was amazing. So uh, obviously in the evenings, some comments were, well, he dominated it and, you know, always Phil X on stage. People have no idea. You need someone to, he's a band leader. He's a, he's a natural born leader up on the stage. Mm -hmm. If he's not on stage, who's singing? Who's singing? We play the next song. Everyone was timid. No one dared to go up there. Mm -hmm. People give, give Jason a hard time, you know, get Jason off the stage, blah, blah, blah. Without Jason, who would have played bass? I thought no, Jason did a great job. No one knew the songs. No one dared to play the songs. Without Jason up on stage, we wouldn't have had a bass player. We need to change that for next year. We need more bass players there. But a few bass players that were there, some left. Some were already at the hotel. Jason just caught it. Whatever needed to be done, Jason knew the songs. Mm -hmm. Did I know all the songs? No. I knew the one song that I played with Phil. And that one I messed up. <laughs> so <laughs> here we got a comment from Randall Fisher. He says, "When next year, uh, Mark, and he's saying me, uh, I need to play during the live jam next year. I'll play, no doubt. Hell yeah, fuck yeah. Um, I played at GitCon too. I mean, at a, at a EVH Con. I went to that, <laughs> which was a lot of fun. I have to say, um, the most fun for me talking about EVH. Um, that stands for something, right?" It's not just letters. I think Eddie Van Halen, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, most fun for me is always to just walk up to people geeking out about Eddie Van Halen and saying, yeah, not my thing. I love that. It's the best <laughs> ever. First night at the, at the hotel bar, Pete Thorne and Robert Baker just totally freaking out about Eddie and the sound. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know any of that. No idea what you guys are talking about. And they're like, yeah, no, this one. I'm like, yeah, I have no idea. I like the one where Sammy Hagar did something. Oh my uh, god! 
<laughs> so but A, it's what I think. And B, it's awesome to get their reaction. And then to throw in there, yeah, I just I prefer Hanson. Um, which I really do. Um, but that's just so awesome to always see people's reaction. I did that to Phil X and and Phil looked at me and said, I love you a little bit less now. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Uh, I tried I'm sorry, I tried Van Hale. I my ex-girlfriend, she was like, no, dude, it's Van Halen's best. And like, especially the early albums and some of the later stuff, maybe, but one, two, is there a third one? I guess there's a third one. Um, just, I tried it over and over. It just didn't grab me. Not my thing. Not that I disrespect it, but just it didn't do what it did for other people. So uh, it's a very unpopular opinion, probably also with you guys. Oh, that's no doubt. I, I, I don't even know. I, I tuned you out about five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, dude, dude, Hanson. You've got to check out Hanson. It's good stuff. I, 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 boom bop, baby. I, you know, no, I no, no, no. There's, there's a lot more than that. That's what everyone says. Okay. They're a right. highly underrated band. I, 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 you didn't, you didn't just you didn't just say that on my channel. He doesn't even know. He doesn't. He doesn't even know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just. I'm trying there to look are, for a good comment. There are highly. Uh, 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 and th this is no joke. I will tell you this. I, I've I've worked with James Labrie, Sebastian Bach. I'm friends with Phil. I mean, I'm not really you know like starstruck by anyone. They're all people. But I was at the booth for Walrus Audio Pedals in Frankfurt, and I geeked out about Hanson. And I said, I've got all the albums. I even have the Christmas album and it's my desert island stuff. So then the guy from Walrus Cold, he records me saying that. And next time I walk up to the booth, he's like, dude, I got something for you. And he has a little video because he sent that to Hanson, me <laughs> geeking out about it. And um, don't know his name. The oldest guy, Nish Taylor, not Taylor, Zach. I'm going to go with Zach. That's his name. Um, he has a special, special he has a, he had a, a, a message just for me saying, hey, Henning, way cool that you dig the band, whatever, you know, next time you're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, because I'm always there, um, come and hang out at the studio. That for me was an amazing moment. Not shitting you. I'm blown away. Yeah, what, just saying. What, so so what, is, what, what is it about the Hanson music that has drawn you to them over Van Halen? I, I must know. <laughs> Over Van Halen. Um, I like, the, the, especially the early Van Halen stuff for me was too disorganized. I like uh, a clearer song form. I didn't quite understand the songs. I, uh, I like it, a more structured song. I like the verse and the transitional bridge and the chorus. And here's my primary bridge and that stuff. Um, and and they just write they write good songs and also what uh, what I like about them is they're inspired. People think they're like a boy group or something, but if you've seen them in interviews or especially like their House of Blues live thing, they're inspired by all the greats, Hendrix, Creedence, uh, all the classic stuff is what made them who they are. So you can hear all that stuff in their music. It's well crafted stuff. Are they shred guys? No, but they write good songs. They got get great tone out of the instruments. Oh. Um, they can all sing. They always sing full three part harmony most of the time, and it's it's well done handmade music. B three organs, you know, it's well crafted music. It's not mind blowing, but it's well done handmade music. Okay, like Dave's been very, Dave's been very quiet, so. Dave, you, you're a secret. I, I, tuned, I tuned him out for a while. So <laughs> as soon as he said Hanson, I kind of tuned out. So all right, well, we're gonna move on. No, I was sitting um, here trying to read some of the the, the chat. So actually, there's a really good comment it's, here. Sometimes about. it's hard to concentrate on reading the chat and also listening. Oh, it is, especially it's, when you mention Hanson. It's very yeah. Well, especially that yeah. Um, John <laughs> Metham has a great comment. Rob Chapman. That's another YouTuber that I'd like to see maybe involved in GitCon or, or something. Well, well, some YouTubers were hesitant because they didn't know 
if the idea was good mm. and maybe someone like Rob, you felt like, well, you know, we were trying to get him there for, you know, pushing ratings or whatever. Me, I don't care. I invited some YouTubers that had 8,000 subs or even less. I had people there with a thousand subs mm -hmm. for me, quality of content mattered. And, um, Obviously, I invited Rob, but he uh, early on, like a year ahead of time. And um, he might not have, I don't know, understood the concept. Thing is, I, I then never really pushed it any further. Hmm. When I, when I uh, offered it to him, it, again, early on, he was like, he was also, I think the de deal was like he was under contract with Anderton's and if he did videos anywhere else, that wouldn't really work. Hmm. Uh, but I never, I never pushed it any further. I would have loved to have him there. Rabia really wanted to come. It would have been great. But they just had scheduled a tour for his band, for Tosca, in Germany, which was funny. So he was touring Germany while we had GitCon. Um, but he, he immediately loved the idea. And um, obviously, it's not like I didn't want Rob Chapman there. Of course, Rob can come. Holy yeah. crap. He, he's a pioneer. He's one of the reasons why this whole, why, why I can do what I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, biggest respect to the guy. Would love to have coffee with him and make bad penis jokes. Um, <laughs> and same, same That'll get him Lee. there. I mean, if if Lee wants to come, uh, here's the thing. Anderton's, they're getting YouTube. Anderton's has a whole bunch of teams now. They have ramped up their game big time. Mm -hmm. um, are they getting shit from some people for what they do? Yeah, I get shit for what I do. Is Anderton's more of a commercial approach than some other people? They're a store. Of course. Well, obvi yeah. Obviously, they're what not going to go. They're not going to go get the new Friedman amp and say, you know what? Nah. Well, A, if someone with that many views says that, they can wreck a product. And B, they're trying to also still have a deal with Friedman so they can sell them. They're not going to completely trash it. But they say as much as they possibly can that they can get away with. I watched, I don't watch a lot of videos from them, but what I've seen is they'll try to say as much as they can and be honest about what they, what they want to say without being, you know, rude. Blatant. They're not blatant it, about it. Sometimes you have to read between the lines. And for having a store, they get away with quite a bit of criticism, you know, subtly. Uh, so props to them props to what lee's built uh with you know his teams and, and really ramping up his youtube game so again without what they're doing a lot of us wouldn't have a job it's mm. legitimizing what we do so um if hey lee if you want to come i'm going to talk to warwick and somehow we're going to make it happen that uh you can continue what you do in england just for a week in Germany, meaning you can crank out the same kind of content, but possibly with you know a lot of us, meaning we'll find you a room, bring your video team, and you'll have your own room. Mm -hmm. TC had their own room, and they did a lot of content. So uh, somehow we could make that happen, that Anderton's has their whole GitCon room. Right. They could crank out quite a bit of content in a week. Very cool. They, they would have to because if they came and left their operation in England, they do a lot of videos. So they have to know that if they come into GoodCon, they get at least that amount of content done there. One concern, and that is also, also something that I'm going to be honest about for YouTubers is I can't, and it's, it's not possible to have YouTubers paid for the videos meaning let's say let's say dave pays me 500 bucks to do an amp review on my channel not that he does but let's say he does um that's what i do here so during the week where i'm at gitcon i would actually lose some money because i don't have paid reviews that i do now i can't walk up to dave at gitcon and say dave i'm gonna do a video for your amp but you gotta pay me because that doesn't work because the manufacturers are already paying to be there. The YouTubers have flown in all expenses paid. They can't go up to the manufacturers and say, I make a video, but I need to get paid for it. So that means that the YouTubers will not have an, that income that they usually would from the videos. 
so that for the YouTubers, GitCon is a great event. They can create a lot of content, but not paid for by the manufacturer's content, if that makes any sense. All right, so, All right. so it's just a week. It's just a week. Well, but for someone like Anderton's, who they do get paid to make yeah. videos. Yeah. If they came, for them, that could mean a serious dent in the income. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a bad or good thing, but it is something they would have to consider. So if Lee says, uh, we can't go to Gitcom because we can't go and charge the companies, because they're already charged to be there, I would understand that he says, look, that means we'd be out X amount of pounds for that week that we could do if we made videos here in England. That would be a val valid reason not to participate, because I can't tell him that he could actually you know, charge for what he does at Gitcon. So what he'd be doing there would be all for free for him. Gotcha. Okay. It's just something. It's it's that's what the situation is, and it has to be figured out somehow. Yeah. Hopefully, the idea of making videos with the community is enough to warrant coming. Right. Cool. I, I guys, I hate to do this, but I have to I have to wrap it up because uh, no dinner is ready, and uh, I got a bolt. Um, <laughs> but uh, hey, there's they, one there's one quick question here that that I, I'm I'm a little. I don't know how to answer it. Uh, Aaron Cram said, what does uh, Dave or any of you think of the way all the uh, companies now have to essentially give away all of their secrets in the marketplace today? Does mm. it change the way you do business? I don't, I, I'm i not exactly sure what he's referring to by giving away all the secrets because I don't necessarily think we give away all the secrets. Maybe just the, the amount of knowledge that you know people are asking from us now, or I'm not exactly sure how he's referring to that. Um, I still think there's some secrets <laughs> that yeah, don't I get mean, really talked about or told. You know, people can you don't still give it all away. I don't. I don't know if I feel anything about this. It's fine. Just, you don't give it all away, and it doesn't make any difference. Even if you gave away your secrets, it doesn't mean that someone's going to make a product that. Um, will compete with you still because there's so much more to it. Having a successful company is, um, uh, there's so much more to, you know, it's having relationships with, with uh, stores and distributors and, and, and the sales staff you have and the marketing that you have. There's so much more to it. It's just, it, you know, anyone can make the product, but it's how, how you market it, how you, um, sell your product, so to speak. You know? mm -hmm. Well, it, it's very simple. If I go and send the Dirty Shirley to Joyo, mm -hmm. not that I'm going to do that, and say, make it exactly like that, and don't skimp on any parts. Clone it one by one exactly, which I'm, by the way, trying to make them stop doing that shit. Um, but if they did that, and it's exactly like it. And I will tell everyone it's, it's exactly like it. But instead of the Friedman logo, it says Joyo. Everyone will still want the Friedman because you see the Friedman logo and you get a Woody. You start drooling a bit, okay? And you start selling your dogs so you can afford one. But it's, that's what Dave and Boutique Amp Distribution has built, <laughs> that desire in us. It's when a brand. See, it's a brand. When you, when you see the Joyo logo, you don't have that desire. Even if I told you it's exactly like it, um, and it's a brand, and everyone kind of knows what makes these amps tick. I'm pretty sure many people could build an amp, and you know, especially if they asked as much money as Dave's asking for them, you know, up to those specs, you can build that. You can find people to do this, but what it took to make that name stand for something. That took a lot of work, that took endorsers, that took building relationships, getting them in the stores. And that is also kind of part of what you pay for, uh, yeah. all that work. Mm -hmm. that, that It took a lot of work. Um, a website needs to be paid for. I mean, part of what you pay oh, for that app is, is the website. I mean, it's as stupid as it is, but it's yeah. all right. Don't don't even get me started on that. I mean, you know, it's it's like people say, well, your amps are very expensive. I go, okay, well, you have to you have to put in perspective. You you have a manufacturing cost of an amp, which 
which generally the basics of a manufacturing cost is the cost of your parts plus the cost of the labor to make that certain product, the labor of that one human who makes it or something. Okay. But no way is that the cost of the product. No. On a large, when you're on a larger scale, okay, you have uh, a boutique has a, 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 a 100,000 square foot building. Um, there's power, electricity, you know, there's electricity and there's, there's insurance and there's everything that goes with just having that building. Mm -hmm. Then you have an accountant that's running the whole accounting um, a, a part, department, maybe an assistant with that accountant. Then, you know, you have a, a marketing um, guy. You have sales, multiple sales staff. You have, uh, you know, someone that sweeps the floor there. You know, you have you have someone that makes, you know, panels and someone that packages it. Someone that puts stuff on pallets. Uh, you have a production manager that orders all the parts. Okay, he's a, like a higher paid salary along with the accountant. So when you start averaging in the cost of all this ex, uh, auxiliary staff into each product you make, that number comes way, way, way up. And well, then and you have to, uh, from the other end, the dealer gets the product for X percentage off of the map price. Okay. So they're starting to meet in the middle now. Now, in the end, the only reason like a company like Boutique Amps Distribution is in business in the first place is to make some money. Otherwise, why? You wouldn't, you wouldn't have a company just to break even and pay everyone's salary, would you? I mean, what's the point? I mean, you know, it's there's... There's no point to that. They have to make a little money. We have to make a little money, but you know it. It it. There's a lot more, way more to it than than people people just think in their head. Well, it only it's only this much in parts. No. <laughs> and when, when you get to the point where you have the product and it's built and it's all that and it's packaged, the players still don't need that the product know that the product exists mm -hmm. unless they know that it's there and they desire it. The product is pointless, which means there needs to be a website, there needs to be pictures, there yep. needs to be people like me. And people like me, even though not expensive, would like to get paid. So technically, Dave needs to figure out whatever the advertising and the product placement, all this costs. Yeah. Um, an endorser, even if an endorser, you know, gets an amp, let's say for free or whatever, whatever they put into an endorser, that is visibility, which helps the player see the amp even exists so that they know they want it. Mm -hmm. And that amp that the endorser gets needs to be figured into the price of all the other amps somehow. Mm -hmm. It's it's marketing, and marketing costs money. It doesn't make the amp better, but it makes you see the amp so that you even know that you want it. And all that stuff, yeah, that's people always say, well, but but the parts are hundred bucks. Might be, might be two hundred bucks, not three thousand, but yeah, it's well, and in Europe it's more than two hundred dollars. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's definitely way more than two hundred. Parts are way, way more than that. But but then here, here in Germany, what what we have to think about is the tax is in the price. So when the amp is thirty five hundred bucks, twenty percent of that is actually tax, which mm -hmm. no one gets other than you know the yeah. German government. Yeah, yeah. In the yeah. US, it's a little bit different. But uh, we need to let uh, Mark go, otherwise he yeah. stops. <laughs> no, I'm telling my wife to get mad at me. Um, we've got a ton of people who are watching. Henning, uh, it was a great show having you on here. We still have almost 200 people watching. Um, For reasons that I don't understand, go to bed. <laughs> Uh, I got to thank everybody for joining and watching in the show. We're going on three and a half hours or more, and um, we talked about a lot of stuff. And uh, Henning, uh, please tell everybody where they can find you, uh, what they can find your channel. Right here. This, this chair right there. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, once and for all, HP42. And it's not Etchy Pie or whatever. Henning Pauli, my initials, HP. And when you write that out in a stupid way, then it's HP42. You can actually type in the letters HP42, and YouTube will still direct you to my channel. So you don't even have to know how to spell it. Oh, good. All right. That's so, where you can find me. All right. And GitCon, everybody check out the GitCon videos. They're awesome. And um, I can't thank you enough, Henning. Thank you again for coming on the show. Dave? Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, and uh, and you guys, if you haven't subscribed to Henny's channel, please do. Uh, and likewise, our own channel, 
<laughs> yes, um, hit, hit the subscribe button. Hit the subscribe button. Uh, you know, we, we hope to have a lot more uh, cool stuff coming up from you in the, in the future here. Oh, yeah. For us. You and I have to talk about some upcoming guests. Dave, I will be bugging the shit out of you about uh, the uh, Synergy stuff. Every time I hit a snack, I want to present this with the correct information. So you yeah, that's fine. Get, that's fine. You get a lot of Facebook messages from me. Yeah, that's fine. That's I'm yeah, I'm up early, so it's 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 easy for me. Just get, getting Abby on any kind of com communication yeah, is not happening. It. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not happening. No. <laughs> so uh, it, it's either you or Peter. I'm going to ask you guys. I think you, you you're probably more help there. Yeah. Cool. Good. All right, cool. I'll, I'll start uh, with more tomorrow. Okay, great. Awesome, Dave. I'll be reaching out to you soon. We'll talk about right. the next show. So we'll we, we'll do sets. You're going out of town for Thanksgiving, right? Yeah. So we'll uh we'll guys we'll be in touch about the next show and when we're going to schedule that. So everybody, ha if we don't talk, uh, everybody have a great holiday, good Thanksgiving. Henning, enjoy your night. Get some rest. All right, buddy. Take yeah, care, everybody. It's, uh, it's almost one here, so I'm going to do that. All right, <laughs> okay. get some rest. All right, take care, everybody. Bye, have a good night. Bye-bye. So